What's going on here? Queen G4 to protect the rook on E2, but then rook takes, no, rook C2 doesn't work. I'm very confused at what's going on here. Rook F1, Queen C6, threatening. Oh, Queen D4, there's rook E2 and Queen, queen H1, mate. Queen takes before is check. He had Queen takes before with check. He missed that opportunity. Oh, no, he lost his by tight. No! No! Robert, in the final position, there's Queen E4 and Queen takes E3. Yes, there was Queen E4 takes E, exactly. But oh, he didn't have any time to figure it out. And said we Welcome, everybody, to the first quarterfinal of the 2019 Junior Speech Chess Championship. I'm Levy Rossman alongside Robert Hess. Well, we started with 16, we're now down to eight, and this matchup, the first quarterfinal that we're being treated to, is amazing. Number four versus number five, Ali Reza Farouja versus Sam Sevion, two of the top juniors in the world, both on their way to great things and 2700 level. So with the bracket in front of you, you can take a look at who our winners are. We've got really three straight days of these amazing events. Uh, We've got Wei Yi, Jordan Van Forest, Parham Magsudlu versus Alexis Serrano, and Jeffrey Jean, who just recently crossed 2700, going up against Benjamin Gladura. More on the matchup today. Let's take a look at the format. Y'all are pretty familiar with this, but just in case you're not, we have 90 minutes of 5-1 blitz, 60 minutes of 3-1, and 30 minutes of 1-1 bullet chess. We actually did have a tiebreaker match happen at the end already once, so let's break it down. It'll be four additional games of one plus one. And then if we need to, we will have an Armageddon. And everybody's favorite topic, what's at stake? In round two here in the quarterfinals, we've got a $4,800 prize pool. So there is 600 bucks if you win. And there is also $600 split based on the win percentage. Yeah, and, not a, Levy, sorry. not a bad payday at all for the uh, winner of this match. No, I mean, absolutely not. If I could get that much money to, to play a little bit of Blitz, I would do it every time. Um, Robert, as we jump into the match prediction, what do you have to say about this? We like to, we like to kind of tear apart the stats team sometime. 70-30, uh, you buying that for all the reason? Ooh, you know, it's tough to say because Sam Sevian is definitely one of the most talented players in this field. He showed true dominance against Nihal Sarin in the opening matchup. But I have to go with Ali Reza Farouja. Not only is he higher in classical chess, he is certainly one of the best bullet chess players in the world. And I don't think Sevian has the same experience in that format to, to stick with Farouja. It's interesting to me that the 5 1 estimate and the 3 1 estimate are one point in Farouja's favor. I really think that comes down to the speed factor. And when things get down to the mere seconds, that's where Farouja has his advantage. But don't count Sevian out. He won the, what, April Title Tuesday event. So he uh, is used to putting in big performances, performance, excuse me, against the very strongest of players. Robert, what I find fascinating uh, is Sam Sevion, one of the only players in this event that has no FIDE rapid or blitz ratings. He's only got a classical rating. That's that's very rare, I would say. I mean, yeah, he doesn't have a rapid rating, but he doesn't. He hasn't been active in very long, but he literally has no blitz rating, unrated. I think it goes to show that there are just not many blitz tournaments in the United States. And Sam Sevian's at that uh, level where he is, what, 26, nearly 70. He gets some invites to good tournaments in St. Louis. He's played in the World Team Championship. The U.S. Championship performed admirably in all those events. But he's not getting the invitations to the biggest of events. So where is he going to play his blitz tournaments, right? There just aren't that many that exist. He's not playing the World Blitz and Rapid Championships, it appears. So uh, I just don't know where he's going to play in blitz tournaments to get himself a nice few day blitz rating. Uh, personally, uh, on, on, on our player screen here, where we have uh, both of our grandmasters, well, I should say all three, and myself, I'm, I'm the uh, odd man out, but we also have a very interesting array of headphones, right? <laughs> We've got small... Invisible, enormous construction. I don't know. Yeah, there's serious ear gear. So I uh, I really, really like it. I like that that chat's all excited. And well, I will say this. I was really impressed with how Sevion performed in the bullet portion of his first match. He was going up against Nihal Sarin. And if you go through that match and you look at some of the public opinion, it was that, all right, all right, Sevion's getting the best of him in this 5-1-3-1. But when it gets to bullet, it's going to be only Halsarin. And Sevion won it 7-1, to one, which might be the most lopsided bullet margin we've had in a Junior Speeches Championship match. Yeah, I think you might be right. And it's interesting to note as well, because 
I don't think Seven had much experience playing Bullet on Chess.com server. So he might be out to fool all of us. You know, we count him out because he doesn't have the same number of games of quantity, but the quality is certainly there. He had one of the nicest checkmates in any speed chess championship match in the history of those matches because he sacrificed a, was it a rook? And then checkmated his opponent. I think it was one of the most beautiful mates. I wish I had the game in front of me so I could show everybody, but Sam Seven is certainly a force. I think that this is one of these matches, which is a true toss-up. We are fortunate to see the final round of 16 matchup between a Wonder Liang and Benjamin Gladura that went to the tiebreaker. But as far as close matches go, we saw Ariantari versus Jordan Van Forest, the uh, aforementioned liang Gladura match. And I think this is going to be the, one of the tightest in the entire JSCC. Yeah, I'm really excited, really looking forward to it. We've got a couple of minutes to go here. Uh, it looks as though Ali Reza actually must have read the chat <laughs> because he changed out his headphones. <laughs> uh, hopefully the chat doesn't diminish, you know, any anything of the uh, of the playing style. But whew, uh, what I really am excited about is that both these guys are basically at the peaks of their powers. And this is what's the really interesting thing about um, the Junior Speeches Championship in particular. A lot of these players, if you look at their rating charts, they're at the best form they've ever been at. I mean, Jeffrey Zhang just broke 2,700, right? Uh, Ali Reza is at his peak. He's almost 2,700. Sevian's a month removed from the highest feeder rating he's ever had. So something about whatever they're, whatever they're training on, whatever they're doing on a day-to-day basis is paying off, and the Junior Speeches Championship is giving them this opportunity to play in, for example, the Isle of Man Grand Swiss, right? I mean, to, to use blitz and bullet as a means to get into more traditional means of playing chess and succeeding at it. Yeah, absolutely. And I think a player that we often kind of forget about, which is funny because he's the highest rated player in the field is Wei Yi, right? Mm-hmm. Wei Yi just played a really nice tournament in Danzhou and he went plus one in a field of, I think over 2,700 average opponent gained a bunch of rating points. And at his level at 2740, it's hard to gain points, but Wei Yi has not been so impressive on, online um, right. in, the, in the speed chess championship in uh, the past year he didn't play so well in his match in his first JSCC match it was much closer than you would have expected with a 1 versus 16 seed matchup uh, but he also was playing extremely late at night I think he'd been out at a concert with friends so what was a lot has to be proven I think by Wei Yi before we take him as in a favorite in this event yeah when I look at it of course you're the top seed because of your classical rating and I think you're world ranking as a junior, but uh, yeah, I, I feel like a lot of people will take issue with him being the top seat. I think a lot of people think that this is Ferruja's event to win, really. So we'll see what happens. Uh, but I think I think we're just about ready to get going. Any second now, we're going to have our first 5-1 Blitz game. And remember, everybody, that uh, it's 90 minutes. So Robert... How would you approach one and a half hours of 5-1 Blitz? That's a great question because I've never played an hour and a half of <laughs> 5-1 Blitz. Uh, but I think you should take your time in the early stages of the game. Uh, mm-hmm. we, we've t- often talked about this, Levy, where when do you rush, you know, when do you play really quickly to conserve your time, and when do you actually spend time? And if I'm playing Ali Reza Faruja, who's, as you mentioned, nearly 2,700 at the absolute height of his game, or I'm playing Sam Sevian, who similarly is, what, 2670-ish, 2660-plus, and at the height of his game right now, it's still growing, both of them as chess players. Like, you have to take them extremely seriously, and that's one of the comments that Ali Reza made in the pre-match interviews. He's like, you know, my first opponent was very tough, in fact, tougher than I expected, and you can't take any of these players for granted. So if I'm Ali Reza, well, I know that I have an advantage as if we both have seconds on the clock, but... You, there's a lot of time that goes in to get to that point. And Sam Sevian has beaten some of the world's absolute best players, in which case, well, I need to take him super seriously. And I'm not taking any second for granted in this match. I, I will say this is pretty interesting, uh, that a player like Sevian and a lot of these U.S. grandmasters like Jeffrey, they get the benefit of playing, you know, three of the world's top 10 or 15 players because they play them in the U.S. Championship, right? I mean, Hikaru Nakamura, Wesley, so Fabiano Caruana. Uh, Ali Reza is basically Hikaru's sparring partner at the moment, uh, yeah. as, we see, as we see game one get underway. Uh, 
Right before we jump into the chess, everybody, let's take a quick peek at the schedule. We've got three straight days of quarterfinals coming up for you. Today, we have Ferruja versus Sevian. Tomorrow, Wei Yi, Jordan Van Forest. July 11th, Maxugu Sarana. And then on July 16th, the final quarterfinal match, Jeffrey Zhang, Benjamin Ladura. Predictions, analysis, all will be done at a later time. For now, we have chess. Yes, we do. And we have Ali Reza Ferruja. That's Ferruja's 2003 with the white pieces playing Konovets. That is Sam Sevian and Levy. I sort of like the decision thus far by both players in the opening, where on move four, we saw an anti-Berlin, right, not allowing the main lines. Instead, we're going to get some jockeying for position. And when you see a, a position like this, now you there's a knight on D2, you often want to reroute that to F1 to G3. But if you go to G3, it's not really doing anything thanks to this pawn on G6. So then the question is, what do I want to do with my pieces for both sides here? Well, there is knight f1. Potentially, it's going to go to g3. But I, I always like to watch how the grandmasters battle it out in these positions. Oftentimes, in these Rue Lopez uh, openings, like you have b5 coming from black very early on uh, to force the bishop back. And then sometimes you have c5. The, the knight on c6 will come to a5, or like in the Briar system, right back to b8 and d7. So in this case, Sam Savion, all right, he's, he's, he's going this way. He's going to win these couple tempo, b5, and there we go, c, c5. And we still see knight g3. So now is really, it, it's the critical moment, Robert. Is white going to try to attack on the king side or look for a central grade? Right, the two options are queen d2, hitting h6, and then trying to maneuver that way. But which is interesting because white could have played pawn to g4 before putting the knight on g3. Mm -hmm. And if the pawn was on g4, that means g5 at any given moment would kind of be used as, the h1 would use, be used as a hook, right? The h1 would take on g5, I could plug a knight on g5, especially in this case, right? If my pawn was on g4, I could play g5 right away, which would be a very good move, most likely, but it's hard to do that with a knight on g3. I have to move the knight and then go and play g4. Uh, but black is not going to sit and do nothing, right? Black's not just going to allow you to attack either, so there's always considerations. Do I play pawn to d5 as black to try to challenge in the center, do I make a move like c4, or is that too committal because then white plays d4 and opens up the center, can then bring the rook to d1 and open up the d file? So, yeah, it's really a kind of a, a waiting, a cat and mouse game right now for both players. Yeah, we actually see a3 and bishop e6 as a kind of direct re response to, to this move a3 from Ali Reza, uh, trying to fight for the b3 square. Uh, but he, he, he's just going for it with b4. Obviously, the idea there was to recapture with the a bombs, the whole reason they played you know, a3. And he's going to be targeting a6. Uh, Chad is claiming, you know, black is equalized, but that, that's the deceptive thing about these positions. <laughs> you can claim equality, but with every single piece left on the board, it's never so simple, right? So the first trade of the game here, move 19. Yep. And that's sort of the beauty of the Spanish is in lines like this, you're really just moving your pieces around, shuffling a bit, trying to find the right squares before any trades occur. And we, right, right now we have two bishops for black, we have a light square bishop where white does not. But how useful is this light square bishop? Which diagonal does it belong on? He puts it on a4, I was about to say. Do you drop back to e6, where it's not really doing too much, or do you drop it to a4, where you stop a rook from coming to d1 because the bishop's over there? Now, if I'm white, I would love to put a knight on b2 or something to hit this bishop, but that takes a really long time. I don't even know how to get a knight there. <laughs> or I play for d4 in the center, but I always have to be concerned about my e4 pawn is there's a rook on e8 staring through the e5 pawn. Right, right, right. Yeah, when, when this bishop was attacked, I mean, it was basically put it on a4 or push the c pawn to c4 and yep. try to lock it in on b3. That seems a little bit overly committal because I think if you drop it back to e6, you were losing the e5 pawn if I take, take, take. But if yeah. I just chop the pawns in the center. And I'm, it's, it's this weird paradox. I mean, you, yeah, you're kind of the only one on the board with the light square bishop. And yeah, it's taking advantage of a nice diagonal. But that could become an endgame liability. <laughs> I mean, it, it might get lost out there over on A4. Uh, th that reminds me, the last show we did together, Sarana Yesipenko, there was a bishop on A4, but it was a white bishop, and it got locked away for yep. a very long time. <laughs> and I think Black just had a huge attack. I think actually White ended up winning that game. But, uh, <laughs> Those but things Black happen. Ended, yes. <laughs> Yeah, you, you, well, you're very right here, Levy. And white can actually consider pawn c4 at some moment, and maybe that's what uh, Ali Reza is setting up for, because pawn c4 is an option as if black takes on c4 with the b pawn, I can take back with the d pawn, 
opening up the default for white and not for black. You have a pawn on d6 that could become a target. And at some moment, maybe I'd like to get my knight from g3 over to, to c3, where it attacks the bishop on a4 and can go to the d5 square. Well, c4 closes that option down. And now is Ali Reza going to play d4? But d4, if we, if we bring up the analysis board real quickly, right? we can play d4, but we have to be very careful about how we drop the e4 pawn. Because after d4, um, if, you know, if we dive into some ana like harder analysis here with d4, then after pawn takes, how do I even take back on d4? If I take with the bishop, aren't I giving away this pawn on e4 here? Like, isn't black, black and time to just grab the pawn and... Yes, yes, it, yes, it looks like it. It looks like uh, this whole idea of putting the bishop on a4 before you play the move c4 kind of softens up this center, right? Uh, you know, I like soft cookies, but soft centers are really difficult here for white. I mean, especially considering you just moved your queen over to a2 to have control of a diagonal. You no longer have control of the diagonal, and you've weakened your center. So right. there's definitely some way to chop and chop and maybe get something going, but, well... I think d5 is a pretty smart, practical decision from Ali Reza. He keeps the position locked, right? And yep. as time continues to dwindle down, well, we did see Sevion very successful in a blitz game, but it can be really difficult to transition from five minutes to one or 30 seconds. So, a Absolutely. And, and Levy, another issue is Black wants to play f5 in a position like this, but your bishop is on a4 rather than on d7. If yes. your bishop was on d7, f5 would be great. The square is very well protected. With this bishop all the way over here, I would consider like rook b2, queen to b1, and then swing my rooks over to the king. So I may rook f1, rook e1, and f5 for black is going to be very hard to play. f4 for white, that could be in the very near future. But if we do play f4, we have to worry about this bishop on g7 unleashing along this diagonal. Yeah, no, f5 is, I mean, the, the rest of the game is basically going to be it's not really going to be stopping f5. It's going to be containing Black's position if he gets to move f5 on the board. Uh, White's three major pieces, which are worth 19 points, 5 plus 5 plus 9, everybody, uh, locked away on the queen side. Yep. Not taking part in what's about to unfold with the move f5. So now Ali Reza is not, at least as far as I know, touted as the world's best defender, right? I think that in youth, you attack a lot and you very good tactically and you're good on playing on momentum but i'm not sure he's made a household name in preventing his opponent's tax so let's see let's see what he how he fares here yeah i mean ali Reza put a knight in h5 right now and you already challenged black's entire setup because mm -hmm. if you put your knight on h5 where's this bishop on g7 going if you drop back to h8 then i take on e5 and h6 is fallen so there are tactics at play here and i think well, D D5 is hanging. Right? I have to be give full credit to uh, Sevian as well. He put his 97 to attack D5. So the question now becomes, am I going to be able to play knight h5 and go for my attack despite losing my pawn center? Or well, I can't even protect the pawn on D5. Your bishop on A4 stops my rook from going to D1. Yeah. Maybe knight f6 was better uh, from, from Sevian to prevent knight h5. Of course, you have to start calculating things like f6, e5, and then taking on D5, right? And Things are things are getting a little dicey. Um, yeah, I think you want to keep the f5 pawn protected, right? So if he put his knight on f6, the knight on g3 would have hit the uh, f5 pawn. So that's why he went to e7 to keep everything safe. Oh, queen e2. I don't, what if you just move the bishop back to h8? Like, don't let him take. Yep, that looks pretty smart. It's still oh, and there's no rook d1. See, I'm I'm, I'm out here looking at moves like rook d1. You can't do that because the bishop on a4. You so, might have to do a desperation, though, Levy. I mean, it's one of those positions where you need activity because you're down a pawn, and this bishop on a4 is still going to be very annoying. So you might just say, you know, I, I shouldn't be able to do it, but maybe I have to. And similarly, if white plays bishop c5 here, expect black to consider rook takes c5 and sacrificing the exchange for that bishop. Well, rook b2 makes a lot of sense because you want to put the rook on d2, but Sevion is extremely solid, and very simple moves like f4, knight d5 are coming. So yep. we see bishop c5, it's a preventative measure. Uh, well, now Ali Reza is going to continue to take that same approach. The more pieces you keep on the board, everybody, with 50 seconds on the clock per player, the more chances you have at random tactics, right? Your opponent might just blunder something by mistake. So we'll see what happens. It's getting yeah. tense. And now knight g4 is an option because the f5 pawn is pinned. So uh, knight g4 here doesn't work anymore. And the reason why we pull up the analysis board real quick is that if you play this move knight to g4, which looks like it's really good because you're just sort of menacing the king side. After queen takes h5, there's no longer knight f6 check because knight f6 takes 
the queen is protected on h5. So that tactic existed until the move knight d5 was played. So if we just go back before knight d5, let's say I made some random like rook c7, then knight g4 is a bit scary because we can't take on h5 because of this knight f6 check hitting the queen on h5. Ali Reza gives a shake of the head there on queen f3, rook g5, very nice move, forces the knight back to g3. Looks a bit paradoxical, like the knight on h5 wasn't doing anything. Why would you force it back to a square where it now attacks f5? Well, now Sam just has to keep his nerves. As long as he doesn't miscalculate anything, uh, his, his prep, whoa, whoa. Okay, g2 is protected by the rook on b2, but knight f4, exactly, that was coming to play really quickly. And now the question is, do I play a move like knight e3, or, or I say knight h4, so I go queen e4 check, right? Queen e4 is going to be quite annoying, and if my knight was on h4 rather than e3, I would stop this exact move, queen g6. So it was a very tense moment there, both players under 20 seconds now, but yes. it's it's really getting hard because rook g3 is now a threat, but there's queen b7 check, right? My queen has some escape checks, but after queen b7, there's rook g7 blocking this check on b7. So actually, I think that black is first to the critical squares. Um, I would have considered a knight h5 maneuver as well to put my knight on g3. Okay, I think Sevian's doing this to gain. He's only getting one second per move. I would go knight d3. I think Sevian might be might be just going to... He, he's, he's just going to repeat. I mean, it, it, it's... Oh, never mind! Ooh, he think, told oh, you. Oh, 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 for one on commentary. Knight takes you too. Yeah, knight takes you too. Yeah, knight takes you too. Get him, get him. There it is. This knight on e3 is overloaded, protecting g2 and the rook on f1. Take here. Okay, what's going on here? There's got to be some. Queen takes f1 doesn't work because the bishop covers g1. Is this going to be some kind of. Rook of was mate. Rook of was was is mate one. Yes. Oh my yes. gosh. They missed mate one. Oh my gosh. But okay, white is now up a piece, but mate one was missed. And. <laughs> that is usually you can't afford to miss mate in one but here i guess he gets away with the take on but with rook f7 uh oh he is he's not getting away with this oh my robert queen d1 queen d1 oh robert. my gosh queen d1 won the rook robert what was queen b2 <laughs> they're just not seeing in the mutual time trouble and oh my. good move a5 a4 is next just move your king away king to a4 play a4 you want that pass pawn Oh my gosh, Robert, what is going on? Queen C1, is, who is playing for a win? I think Black is. I, I think so too. Wait, you can win. Rook A7 <sighs> is immediately at the very least holding. This is also good. <gasps> oh, I thought the Rook was hanging. Wait, wait can you, you take the Rook? You could have taken the Rook and pushed take the Rook. Yes, take the Rook. Wait, is it mate? <laughs> <laughs> this is a ridiculous game. Push that A pawn. If Knight C6 is Queen F3 check. Oh no, it's a draw. After all that. Wait, what? No, we need to work. We need to Take the rook. Take the rook. Take the rook on e7. Oh no. Okay. Wait, he's gonna get himself mated. Yeah, rook c7's mate. So queen of uh, queen g5. Take, take the rook. rook. Now take the rook. <laughs> take the rook. Take it. You have to take it. And there it goes the a pawn. Oh my goodness, Robert Hess. <laughs> I am just. This is unbelievable stuff on the first knight of six. Take that h pawn. There's no check to win the knight. Oh my gosh! Is Robert white... is what is white winning? <laughs> <laughs> um, you're gonna lose the night. You're, you're totally gonna lose the night. No, uh, King D7. Just go for the mate. Mate him. Why? No, King D7. King C was mate. Why wasn't he? Why isn't he trying no. to mate? Him? No, he had mate. Don't blunder Knight C5 uh, with a four. Okay, you got to get the king. What's gonna happen in this game? This is the wildest game I've ever been a part of in SBC <laughs> history. It's the first game of the match, and we've hit a hundred moves. Gonna him. He's going to mate him. King c6, queen b5. Okay, king a4, only move. Now take b6. Okay. Oh, my. Watch black sacrifice the queen for the two minors to get, like, a winning king opponent. Yes, yes. That's, that's, that, I'm on the lookout for that. This is completely insane. We're going to hit 150 moves. <laughs> we're, we're already at 108 moves here. Uh-oh, queen oh, mate. Oh, and he blunders. He blundered mate. He blundered mate. Oh my gosh, that was unreal. What's in, what just happened? Okay, <clears throat> for the record, you know, if we pull up the analysis board, um, there was checkmate in one move for for uh, uh, Ali Reza. I like, can't even say their names correctly. I'm so at a loss. Like in this first game here, there was a checkmate. There, there was a mate. And where was it? It was like, when things got, started getting wild, you gotta go like 60 moves back. Yeah, I, I, I found the moment. There was rook f8 checkmate because the queen covered h7. So that was a mate in one that was available to Ali Reza that he missed multiple times because he was just moving so quickly. So he missed checkmate in one. Okay, 
I think seven was better before that. And then seven was better after. Then Ali Razor was probably better after. I mean, it just got nuts. But let's go to the current game because that may, did not happen. Instead, we are 1 0 7. And we'll have to ask both players about that first game, especially if this match is close, Levy, because that was just absolutely wild. Yeah, that was completely crazy. And I, I obviously, from a commentator and a spectator perspective, you want much more of that over the next three, three to four hours. Uh, our energy is really high. Just want to give a shout out. Chat was going crazy throughout that entire game. People were like, I love this match already. We're only 10, 15 moves in, one game in. So shout out to all of you watching on the chess.com homepage and on the Twitch front page. Well, it's, uh, man, this is, uh, this is the Junior Speech Chess Championship, baby. Quarterfinals, first one. Ali Reza, Sam Sevion. I can't even, I don't even know what's, that game was unbelievable. I just want more of that, Robert. I, me too, and I feel some pain in my chest. You know, I just was just really just going so hard there in that first game that I have to conserve some energy. And right now with the white pieces, we see that look at this pawn e4, very well defended. Look at the b6 square, not so well defended. So an idea with knight c4 and putting the bishop on b6 is clearly an option for white. And okay, d5 break happening already. So what's happening if I take on e5? That's always what you have to consider, right? If I take on e5, what, are you taking on e4 or are you pushing d4? Black has the option to go for the bishop on e3 rather than the pawn on e4. Yeah, Black's entire position looks basically destined to play a move like d5. <laughs> you have, you have every single piece controlling that square. Um, so Ali Rez is the type of player, at least I've seen probably close to hundreds of his you know, head-to-head -head games against Naraditsky, Andrew Tang, uh, Hikaru Nakamura, obviously, Blitz, Bullet. Uh, he likes to get things back. I mean, he does not like to have a bad streak. Uh, so I wouldn't necessarily call it like a like a tilt, meaning when he starts losing in a game that he might, you know he knew he might have been winning, he's not going to play necessarily overly aggressively. He's actually going to keep his head, and he's still going to play what he thinks are the best moves, especially not in bullet. Over the a five minute game is it's like a novel, right? It's like a you know there's a there's a beginning, a little introduction, and a and a climactic moment. In the past game, maybe five of them. <laughs> yeah, uh, a lot of you know betrayals, those kinds of things. Um, it's not bullet. In bullet, it's very easy to let emotions get the best of you here. Ali Reza hoping, hoping to get a win with black and then just even the match. And then that first game just goes out the window. Yeah, no, that's very true. It's easy to forget your mistakes when you start winning games. But it's, the more you kind of flounder, if you draw this game or lose this game, even worse, then you're like, oh my gosh, if I just won that first game, if I'd seen that meet and won, how could I miss it? And you start questioning your own, you know, your own game, so your own quality of chess. And right now, bishop takes f6. I'm not sure if there's, is e5 a plan here? It's trying to go e5 and just like make things absolutely wild. Uh, let's. Yeah, so, so for the moment, everybody, uh, black is actually able to get away with this. Like pawn takes f6, bishop f6, maintaining that central fork. Obviously, you're not gonna cash in immediately on the fork because then after I take your bishop on e7, I'm hitting your queen and your rook. You've got to react to that and then you can't continue to chop my pieces. Right. So, Robert, e5 might actually be the only way to go, because if you play bishop f2 or something, I mean, just taking c3, taking again, doesn't look very good. So, Yeah, and it's definitely a, a position that requires some real analysis, which is why Sevian's down the clock. And if we do our own ana analysis here, right, e5, there it's played. And it's actually a very good-looking move, because you're challenging this bishop on f6. And you take on e3, I take on f6, and now white is still up a piece, so you should take my knight on d2, perhaps your queen, but if I, when I start taking on g7, then maybe taking on d2, who's better here and why? I mean, I think that black is probably better after just a simple move like king takes g7 because the c2 pawn feels weak, my e pawn is a passer, but the black king is also not particularly safe. So in certain lines, if I play bishop takes c6 and you take my queen on d1 and I just take back with a rook, maybe I can get after your king with like rook f3, rook g3, or go after your e pawn somehow. But I, I like black's position. Something tells me that black should be better. Typically when you get in, d5 early black is doing quite decently and in this moment here um i would not play bishop takes e5 that's for sure because of knight c4 right that's the one thing that you have to uh keep an eye on but maybe just, even that's okay i tried to sneak in a quick water break there while we had the analysis board up but i was caught red-handed <laughs> uh, <clears throat> sorry about that you know even even commentators drink every now and then water 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 yeah so now we're gonna get very Interesting and exciting. What I like is that they, they get into these tactical skirmishes with two minutes on the clock. Yep. Right? <clears throat> so 
Whew. Pawn takes d2. Uh, generally, losing a pawn like this in front of your king is meaning for black is kind of dangerous. I mean, right. if, if I just play fg7, black is not going to take back with the king, but is instead going to play rook e8, at least I'm assuming. Robert, what did you call that? An umbrella pawn? Is yeah, that what that's it, called? Exactly, right? Protected from the rain, and while well, there's a storm of pieces that can come attack the king, so you like that. But look at his bishop takes c6. He was trying to get queen g4 in there, right? Because if you got uh, queen g4, it would pin the pawn g7 to the king and threaten mate and make black feel very uncomfortable. Queen d4 not only keeps an eye on the g7 square and the f6 pawn, but also stops the queen from going to g4, but he gave away d2, which is actually a bad trade for uh, black. Yeah, black is definitely much worse in this endgame. I mean, material is completely equal, but black has, well, I was about to say three pawn islands because I somehow grouped together the kingside pawns as one, but it's actually, it's just a bunch of pawn islands. I mean, he's got three standalone pawns and double that pawns, while white's just got three and two. Um, generally, in situations like this, black does get kind of more, a little bit more open lines. His rooks can look down the E and B files, for example, but if white stays solid and plays a coherent attacking mechanism on these queenside pawns, I can't imagine that, that that white doesn't win this game. I mean, white is the one playing for two results, I would say. Right, and B3 was a move to stop knight coming to C4. Like, imagine this pawn being back on B2. Knight C4 would be my next move, forking the pawn on B2 and your rook. And here, if I'm black, do I want to play rook to D8? Because I would like to put my rook on D2. And actually, this position, I think he put the wrong rook there. And I'll explain why. So we draw up the analysis board real quick. Um, knight d4 now is an option exactly for white. But if, and if you play c5, then I can drop my knight back to f3. And I'm protecting everything because c2 is not hanging with this pin on the e file. If I put my other rook to d8 to start with, knight d4, I would go rook takes d4. Oh, I couldn't do that. Because at the rook d4, knight c2, I thought I was forking your rooks. I have a rook g4. Check. And then I move my rook away. So I'm the fool. They're the excellent players. I tried for tactics that don't work. That's all right. Well, Farouj is trying to, to gain a healthy time advantage in this game so that the advantage that white has slowly begins to slip. Uh, rook e4. All right. So probably knight f3. Look at this move from black, just rook e8, gluing the, the knight on e3 and making it really difficult for white to make a move. Yep. F5, F4, I mean, he's just going to continue, but I like this, knight d2, and that's a smart move from Ali Reza. Maybe just knight f is can you play like knight f1? Is that knight f1, I have knight takes c2, because I can take on c2 as your rook can't take me back with your rook. Very nice. Very so nice. Actually, this is turning for black, I feel like. Yeah, all right, he's using his structural weaknesses, but like I said, he's, he's, he's trying to play dynamically and aggressively, so... And black can consider playing pawn to f4 as well to just cement that then e3 if you come at oh especially now that you did that because i thought after f4 at some moment you might try to play g3 to remove the knight's defense but now i see this setup and i think can i get my pawn on f4 and my knight around to g3 and kind of try to checkmate you on the first rank and here it goes what's your rook doing on d2 where's it going you can't go to d5 can't go to d4 can't go to d6 well, my complaint was as follows. I mean, even if black gets a bunch of active play with this knight in the rooks, the pawns are what are holding him back from actually making any sort of real winning chances. I think that if his pawn was on like g5 instead of f4, or on g5 instead of h6, then you can maybe cohesively try to attack with the pawns, right? But maybe I'm a naysayer. I just doubt his position, but I don't see where you're going to make that breakthrough. Having said that, Ali Rez is the guy that's 3,088. So I'll let him show me the way. Yeah, you know, he's got a pretty high rating next to his name. And also C4, there it is, as soon as I was about to say. He's going to you get rid of his weak, isolated pawns and start uh, putting weaknesses in White's position. And C3 was a threat at some moment, because by going C3, you kick this rook from his defense of the C2 pawn and get an advanced pawn. But here, C3 is probably just by rook to D3, and so it's not a great move. Um, but you don't have to take on B3 right now. I would not take on B3. Because trading on b3 gives white the c5 square for the rook and a little bit more activity. I love this move, knight f5. Now knight g3 threatens knight e2 check, forking the king on g1. Wait, the rook wait Robert, what about rook d5, like knight g3, and then I just move my king away from this knight e2 threat? How are you going to defend it against right. rook a5? Okay, I, I'm going to give you my a5 pawn and just start going after like maybe rook e2 here, and then other rook to e3 and attack your knight on f3. Um, there's just... I don't know if it's good enough, but it looks at least menacing, and white is 12 and a half seconds left. Yes, that's the best way to describe it. 
Practical chances. Yes. Practical and chances. Even a move like rookie two, like I said, immediately giving up the C4 pawn. That's an ugly pawn. I don't care about that. Like rookie two, he was rook C7. That's a nice move as well. So think, okay, you can't stay here on C1 because you're rook. You're going to take, take on E1. Oh, gosh. Take, on e1. take, take, take rook C1. C1, exactly. And wow, you're barely holding on. Play rook B1. Just, just sit and wait. Unless you can kick this rook. Wait, the rook can't go on the E file still. Yeah. Yep, it's I over. Forgot. Oh no, it's over. King of eight and the king of seven. Ouch, 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 ouch. Your rook can't stay put. And he loses on time as well. That was a that was such a quick turnaround. Wow, very impressive stuff from Ali Reza. There you go, it's 1-1. One, one. It's even the first game is out the window. Man, he was one move away from it being 2-0. Yep. He must be, yeah, he must be kicking himself. All right, now we're playing into the... Berlin. It's a very topical line. Will Ali Reza play d4 and rookie two? Rookie two is kind of this more trendy modern move. Okay, he just plays rookie one. Yeah, rookie two is his funny move to uh, try to get a quick doubling on the e file. Said he plays the typical line with rookie one. If you take on e1, queen takes e1, and then you take on d4, there's often problems in the d6 square and a quick development for white. So it looks like white is hanging a pawn, and in fact, you are. You're sacrificing a pawn for a very quick play. And so, you know, Rook takes, he's doing it. If he takes on d4, watch out for knight c3 coming. I'm keeping up the pressure on the d6 knight. So he plays knight e8, which is pretty standard um, just to keep everything safe and sound. But after, still, bishop takes d4, I'm moving my knight into the action with knight to d5. And there are a lot of tricks here. So you have to be very careful. Yes, very tricky position. Um, but Sevian is also, if I'm not mistaken, like a lifelong e45 guy. I mean, the yeah. key has not played... I don't think he plays Sicilian whatsoever. I mean, I might be mistaken. I don't play e4, so when I played him with the white pieces, I didn't have to prepare against that, but I'm fairly certain that he, he's, he's got a bunch of different tools in e4, e5, so he's, he's quite familiar with these things. Uh, one thing to mention, which we, we were informed before the show, Ali Reza actually changed a couple of things about his streaming setup. He's been streaming a bit more like for Arena Kings. Uh, he got, I believe, a new mouse. If I'm not mistaken, he maybe a couple of other logistical details on his end. So it was a little bit curious. I mean, after all, this this is an online match. How will these things affect him? Uh, that first game was negative, but the second game, it looked like he had really, really gained his footing. And uh, match is even. Here we go. Yeah, and I actually want to point out this is the same position from McShane Dominguez from the it's recently concluded Netanya Masters. So I, I was looking at this, and the reason why I kept saying knight c3, all this stuff, I had just seen this exact position. And this is the position where Dominguez took on b2, I'm pretty sure. And it's very complex and very difficult for black because look at your queen side, right? Your rook's not developed, your bishop's not developed. The e7 square, maybe I can hop to a check at the right moment just to cause you some issue. And in that game, McShane actually went ahead and almost mated Dominguez, and Dominguez got a bit desperate. He had to, and he sacrificed his queen there. So just to kind of show how quickly things can turn, in that game, this bishop got in big trouble because if we pull up the uh, analysis board, he went bishop takes b2 here, and after bishop takes b2, and which just has happened, by the way, rook b1, he went bishop e5, f4 came on the board, and all of a sudden you see that this bishop's in, in trouble. He ended up going c6 and allowing um, several captures, if I'm not mistaken, and white went on to win a very nice game. The rook swung up to uh, b3. There's attacks going on that were very difficult for, um, for black to eventually meet. Robert, this is very much like you know, 18th century chess, where white just sacrifices a bunch of pawns, has an enormous lead in development, and yep. then just goes on a checkmating attack. I really like this. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm really liking this style from Alirasa. Yeah, he, he's, just, he's just pushing his opponent. Yeah, no, he, and he's following... The, the good news for him, especially, is that he's following a game that just concluded, and it looks to me like Sevian does not know that game. Because, A, you don't venture into this unless you've studied it, or B, you play a little bit more quickly if you have studied it and have found improvements. So I'd be very concerned if I am a Sevian fan here or from Sevian himself, because, like I just mentioned, I know for a fact this is from the game McShane Dominguez, recent game between the what, nearly 2,700 McShane and the 2,760 Dominguez. That's elite-level chess right there. and Very difficult territory already for Sevian. 
Well, it also goes to show you that Ali Reza is fully immersed. These guys are preparing every single day. I mean, I, I actually tried to start doing something like this to, you know, to push for the GM title. It's every day, go pick a tournament that they're playing abroad. I mean, with, with, with all these different, you know, places like chess.com slash events, by the way, you can look at all these live games, analyze them on your own, get new opening ideas. That's what I try to do. I'm a D4 player. If I see that some, you know, Magnus plays against MVL in the last round of Croatia, for example, plays an idea in the Grunfeld. Oh, wow, I should go take a look at that. So yep. that's what he's doing here. And then he analyzes it, verifies it, and now he's going to go use it. Boom, right here. Speeches championship match. This is really bad news for yeah. Seven. He doesn't realize it, but he's following this exact game. Okay, I'm going to, this is a, sort of a mental note, but I'm asking everybody to remind me. Game one, of course, the crazy time scramble. And game three, the preparation by, um, by Ali Reza here. He just, he's in his wheelhouse. He just saw the game. He, um, you know, this is good news for Perugia fans. And I think we're still in the game. I'm pretty sure that here, Queen G3 was played. Bishop C6 followed up. And, yep, so attacking here, Bishop C6. And if I'm not mistaken, he didn't play Rook F1 because later he went his Rook to B4. So I think he moved his Bishop to G5 first with ideas in the future of putting your Bishop on H6. And Bishop G5 allows Queen H4. More pressure on F6. Threatening mate on h7 with the bishop and the queen lining up. So this is still, still McShane, Dominguez, still wow. going to probably raise up, up a minute and 20 seconds on the clock. Robert, he's, he's got to know that he's following that game. I mean, right, like, uh, <laughs> I don't know. That's, that, that's my, that's my su suggestive noise indicating that I think that uh, he, still, he still knows what's going on. And it, it, it just shows the benefit, right? I mean... They're playing by win percentage, and also their this preparation will become useful in some of their future games. So, what I what's amazing to me is that this is only the third game, and yep. it's going to take so you know a little bit of time to finish. But we've only got fifty eight minutes in this segment, so like mathematically, it's just crazy how much time these two invested in these three games. Every game has been a brawl. It's gone to an end game. Probably this one will not be decided by a checkmating attack, although as I say that, Queen F7 comes, but still looks like black is pretty solid. There mm -hmm. might be. Bishop E7 F8 ideas is a possibility, or Bishop F6, some kind of idea as well. Bishop F6, oh, and Rook F6, that's... That probably oh. doesn't work, is my guess. Like, if we, if we pull up the analysis board, it's like, what I love to do is just sacrifice people's pieces that aren't mine, right? I'm just like, <laughs> let me get a remaining attack. It looks cool. Uh, but the point of bishop f6 is that if you take me on f6 with the knight, and I take back with my rook, you can't take back with the pawn because I mate you with queen h7, uh, right? That's made on the board. And if you do nothing, I'm going to go queen f8 and checkmate you on the back rank, or I'm going to go rook takes h6 check. Whoa! Robert! Oh, what? Hold on to your hats, bishop f6! Uh-oh, queen e3, only move. Oh, but then oh. bishop takes g7 check. Oh no, queen e3, if we keep, like, we keep looking here, bishop g7, rook g7, rook f8 is mate, down in the back rank. Oh, Ali Reza flexes at the end. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm over two of my predictions. I'm gonna just be quiet for the, next, for the rest of this segment. I'm gonna just let Ali Reza do what he does best because I said it does not look like the game might end with a king's side attack. And Ali Reza sacrifices the bishop on f6. And yeah. that's why that's why he's playing, all right? That's why he's playing. So that's all I gotta say. That's unbelievable stuff. Yeah. Um, and shout out just... to Robert Hess, by the way. Robert Hess, just absolute machine with his <laughs> sacrifice idea. I like I said, it's, people always ask me, like, why do you see so many sacrifices when you're doing commentary? I'm like, they're not my pieces. And I always want to sacrifice pieces, right? Like, Levy, you know that feeling. When you see yes. a team and you see a potential attack, you're like, let me sack my queen for checkmate. Let me sack that rook for mate or mating attack. And you're like, oh, wait, that doesn't work. But, well, it's, it's practice. And it helps me kind of explore more diverse ideas. And I think it helps you get better at chess as well. So, small note also, uh, just before we, we jump into game number four, uh, Ali Reza was a move away from this being three zip. I mean, it has not been in doubt since that shaky first game. He's, he's done very well. He fought back from a worse position, and he comprehensively outprepares his opponent, gets a completely winning position, beautiful sacrifice, and he wins. So yep. every game has been a completely different story. So 
with that in mind, let's pull up our daily question, Robert. And that, for today's show, is which junior speech chess championship player do you think is the most fun to watch? Now, you guys can do whatever you want uh, with this question. It could be classical, rapid blitz, doesn't matter. But uh, you could tweet at us, hashtag speech chess, and uh, get involved on Twitter. I will probably reveal our picks later, right? I think it's a pretty safe bet. That's a tough question to answer, honestly. Yeah, because the easy answer is Ali Reza. But that's not my answer, actually. Ah, okay. Amazingly, I mean, yes, that is the easy answer, and I love seeing Ali Reza's games, but I have a different answer that'll hold on until later in the match. Well, we also have some very interesting player cards. This game is also heating up with this new move, Night G4. Ali Reza is making his intentions known very quickly. Uh, so let's pull up some player cards. So starting with Sevian. He's from the United States. Speed A rating at the moment, 2677. World Junior ranking number four. His interests, kind of interesting, variants. So I'm assuming he likes some 960, a little bit, little bit of a you know, giveaway, etc. King of the Hill. He believes that his strength is aggressiveness. Ah, uh, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll go with that. Interesting. Yep. But his weakness is preparation. That, that's an interesting one, because I actually thought I outprepared him, and then he steered the game totally out of theory on move five. <clears throat> and he told me after the game that his whole purpose of that was to steer the game out of preparation. So we'll see. Um, the quote that he brings to the table, Fisher in him, key to survival of chess. The young generation is fed up with digging through computer lines in the Petrov. Enough. <laughs> <laughs> I love how you emphasize that. But I also will say that going against main lines is a form of preparation. Like that's what Magnus was so good at, right? He wasn't going to the most topical lines, but he's going to lines that he was comfortable in and he consistently outclasses people in them. So uh, I think Sevian can have a similar success where you don't need to play every single main line, every single main move, but if you are comfortable in the structures and know what you're doing, that is a form of preparation. Yeah, absolutely. Um, on the flip side, his counterpart for the day, Aldi Reza Perugia from Iran, the third best junior player in the world, currently sitting at his peak B day of 2685. He's got an interest in fancy technology. Well, look at that. <laughs> <laughs> Who doesn't, Robert, huh? Who doesn't? I want my toaster to be able to beat me in a chess game. I want my water to boil instantly instead of having to actually sit and boil. So, yeah. Well, there you go. He thinks his strength is mouse speed. Maybe that's some of the fancy technology. But his weakness is frustration. I commended him earlier on his ability to overcome tilt in some of these blitz and bullet matches he plays against the best players in the world. But obviously, well, don't we all have tempers when we play these fast games? And an interesting fact, he's playing with a new mouse. He received a few hours ago. So. <laughs> you know, that it really could hurt. People think, oh, a new mouse? How's that sound interesting? I saw that in the chat. But, you know, it, it really could come back to hurt him in these bullet games coming up in the later se segment of this match. And right now, speaking of hurt, Black's pieces are hurting for useful squares. Look at this. It's like they're playing checkers in the light squares. I mean, you have the queen to the all the way to the f5 scored pieces c6 to e8 you got this you know h7 i mean i'm just having too much fun in the light squares and of course now he puts a piece in a dark square so g5 is he gonna take with the rook but then c4 looks very painful you just lost your light square bishop so i want to open up the light squares for my pieces well, c4 but also bishop g4 right oh bishop g4 also is painful yeah i mean but everything looks good f6 f6 <clears throat> it, it kind of feels as though white is abstractly better i mean you know white is better like if you look right. at this video white is definitely better but like how am i gonna how am i gonna do this because any way i push forward i will also be creating a little bit of weaknesses for my opponent to potentially play with like when you play c4 your central dark score is a bit weak and maybe black six, eight, six right now oh that's robert give s square <clears throat> give eight, me the h5 eight. there it is and this rook on e8 is also trapped. That's, I thought about h 6 last move, but I think c4 was better. But I saw the rook on e8 has no moves because the bishop on c5 covers the squares. So as soon as you put your rook on f7, my bishop belongs on h5, skewering both of your rooks. And, okay, bishop h5, and you're going to rook takes h6. Ooh, oh. 7 is hanging. That's an important pawn. You might want that one back. Yeah. And now it's c takes d5, followed by bishop b5, pinning the knight on c6. This is over. This is totally toast. That's amazing. Speaking of over, we're also over 6,000 viewers, so shout out to all of you watching on the Twitch homepage. This is the official chess channel on Twitch. We've got Junior Speed Chess Championship coverage for the next three days. If you think that this is exciting, you better stick around for tomorrow and the day after, and July 16th. But 
three straight days of, of this kind of chess is amazing. Like I said, these players are at the peaks of their powers. Can you say the same thing about your own chess? I don't know. Maybe some of you can. I definitely can't. So, ah, Michigan 7. Will Ali Reza survive this one? I cannot see a way in which he does survive it. If he does, he's a real miracle worker. Even an idea with bishop h5, where you take on h6, pinning my bishop to the rook, and I just take your rook on e8. I, it's a fancy way of trading rooks, but black's king is in a worse position. A lot of the pawns are vulnerable. So he goes knight b3, and, well, that's also a good move, just trying to get your knight active, go after some of the targetable black pawns, which are on light squares, and have a light square bishop. So looking good for... Sam Sevian up a pawn currently and with a superior position. The most difficult thing about these positions with so many pieces actually on the board, even though your advantage might be as big as it is, is the counterplay element. And with five relatively important pieces, two knights, bishop, two rooks, you're always on the lookout for that. But yep. <laughs> the bad news here is that you can't really move any of them anywhere, right? Because <clears throat> white is so dominant. Even the h1 rook plays a an amazing role in covering h6 and also maybe rook h5 in the future? Maybe? Definitely a possibility. Ooh, gosh, the pawn structure. Oof, pains me to look at that. Yeah, what is the idea here? I don't... I... <laughs> Ooh, okay, let's see. How many good moves are there? d5 is also an option, but I wouldn't play it because it gives the knight the e5 square. So what this black is ab absolutely desperate for is a nice space for the pieces. What a5 is hanging as well. I mean, this is just... Levy, this is not good news. Yeah, Sam is just taking the very easy way out. I was I was looking at what he wants after rook e7, but I think he just wants to take and play knight c5. He might also play rook b6. Wow, okay. Ali Reza just resigns. He just yep. wants the next game. He, he resigned. And I saw someone asking about, um, you know, how these players being young and things like that. I'm pretty sure their parents are all involved and, you know, they know that their kids are playing for potential prizes and they're happy for them because it's you know, nice to be able to play online chess for several hours and be able to win quite a deal of money. You know, and they, these are very talented players and um, they put a lot of work, right? You see that these players are playing this match over a three and a half hour, four hour period, but the amount of preparation that goes in, not just for this specific match, but in general, is hours and hours and hours each and every day. Yeah, I mean, chess has always been known to be a bit of a niche activity, and there's not a lot of opportunities at a young age, or really at any age, uh, to, to win some money and get further opportunities for your career. So this, is, this has never happened before the Junior Speeches Championship. It's the first edition, as well as the Women's Speeches Championship that just wrapped up. So all the naysayers in the chat, <laughs> there's very few, all, all around the world, saying, ah, they're kids, they shouldn't be doing this. Um... <laughs> Don't be so naive. Come on. Come on. <laughs> and I love the question, M. Benoni123 goes, Robert, does your dad know you're on here? He does. He actually frequently watches uh, the commentary because he can play a little bit of chess himself. So that was a funny question, though. Okay, watch out for F2 square. Mm -hmm. Always looking down at the F2 square. Like, if I can go knight F6, knight G4, queen H4, that's my... Whoa. Whoa. Now, now I'm thinking for white, can I go knight E2 to F4 to E6? Like, it's an interesting trade-off. On one hand, f5 allows you to put a knight behind a pawn, which gives you access to squares like e4 and g4, perhaps even uh, better for white to get there. But then you look at the e6 square, and that could be a problem. But, the, Robert, the, how fast he played f5 just simply indicates to me that he must understand this position. It's either you know, you're going to dig up, like, uh, Grandmaster A versus Grandmaster B, 2018 Czech Republic Championship, or something like that, right? But... Uh, he, he's, whoa, can you go g5 here from black? I'm certainly thinking about it, but he wants g5, so you can just go bishop e3, right? He's saying, please keep pushing your pawns forward. This reminds me of another game, Jeffrey Zhang versus Le Quang Liem from, um, <laughs> from the uh, Summer Classic in St. Louis. I'm trying to remember the name. But he drew pawns forward when he had this bishop on f4 just so he could create more weaknesses in black's position before deciding what to do with his piece. So, you know, he wants... Black to push these pawns forward so he can get an even better position for his pieces. All right, Robert, I believe you. I, I'm just, I'm just gonna have to go with it. I, I did look at those games in St. Louis. There was, if anyone doesn't know, wants to go take a look at some of those games. There was uh, three double round robins. So it was a group of six players that all played each other two times. Really a, a fascinating event. Gave a lot of opportunities for grandmasters 
And in the Group C, I think there was one of U.S. top talents, Brandon Jacobson, was going up against the GMs. He had a pretty solid event. So there's another opportunity in chess. So y'all got to stop complaining. I don't mean to be the Charles Barkley of the broadcast. <laughs> you a knucklehead. Yeah. Uh, but you're right. And Sevian actually played in the B group. He, I think he underperformed a little bit, but it's a very tough group. And right now with the black pieces, he's trying. Okay, F3 was played, which didn't feel entirely necessary. I'm going to rook to E7. But I guess he's counting on the fact that their A8 rook is a bit stuck protecting A7. So you'd love to play rook A to E8 under normal circumstances, but you can't do that with Ness White with B6. But now ideas with like bishop A6, queen C4 going right after C7 looks very painful. Yeah, B6 in the immediate bishop B5 looks very nice because then you're going to dig away at the weak light squares, the weak C7 pawn. B6 looked very, very committal. I mean, it makes sense from the perspective that I want to move my A8 rook. And if I do, we take A7. But maybe he should have played A6. This looks honestly terrible for black. Like, really, really bad. I mean, what, what you, what's your idea for black? So, Levy, I'll give you a couple free moves. What's your idea? Besides taking my pieces for free. I always like to play this game envisioning a future and finding the best squares for my pieces. Like, this is so obvious for white. And now A7's hanging, C7's hanging. If C7 falls, D6 is hanging. I, honestly, I wouldn't be that surprised if... Sevian is completely lost in the next, like, three moves. Well, Ali Reza bobbing his head really likes his position. I think he's doing his best Hikaru impression. Uh, <laughs> Hikaru, you know, bob and weave a little bit, get groovy with it. Uh, I don't know if you know the mixed martial artist Tony Ferguson, but uh, he's famous for an, an interaction in the octagon where he, he basically did a salsa move. I mean, he, like, spun around and then, like, threw an elbow. And I was like, I wish I had that much grace. Uh, when I when I play chess or I don't know do anything really play some basketball, um, but yeah, Ali Reza has got a very nice structural advantage here. C seven pawn permanently damaged. Uh, can't really go anywhere really. It's just sitting duck. A seven C seven all these things. And you can't really seed control of the E file either because then I put a piece on E seven and more attack to go with. And White's king is very safe because. The queen on f2 does a good job protecting all the squares, the, the back rank, the diagonals. So this looks really, really, really bad for um, for a seven. When you play Blitz, do you like to listen to music? No, not really. I think it, uh, it really depends. I'm more of just a play type of guy, and I also play on my phone. So mm -hmm. it's just like I have to be kind of more concentrated. But I, I often also do have music on in the background. Okay, so f4 here. It's still definitely an option. Where's this knight going? If you're F4, you want to go to knight G4, go H3. You're not going to mate me. And well, I might go and mate you first anyway. So this is looking bad. Bad news. H3, as you said. He might throw on queen E6 check first, but yes, certainly yes. that's the trick. Yes. Queen E6 is very logical. Just got to be a little bit careful in these situations not to allow some some random perpetual with like queen d1 while you're losing all your well uh <laughs> yeah i was gonna say queen c8 check was also possible taking on c7 with check next because after queen c8 if you're on queen e8 i could have taken on f5 with check but th that's the type of thing that sevian needs to do is somehow get this queen off the e-file well not queen d1 at least is a check that can hit c2 so some counterplay here for black. And this is exactly what Sevian needs. He's playing pretty quickly, which is smart. Um, and he has chances, outside chances to hold. Knight takes d7 is just a good move, though, because you're protecting d5, you're undermining d6. So just probably take on d6 and then play knight e6 to g5 with check. Yeah, good. I was thinking queen d6, and you can even go back to e6 with check and push the d pawn. And then you defend c7. That's also another possibility. Oh, that looks real nice, actually. Yeah, I mean, from there, like, d7, obviously, your knight is hanging, um, but, yeah, slowly but surely, right, so. The problem is the knight in f6 is actually a really good piece, though, so maybe black can kind of start taking some of the pawns. Okay, so we might, we might see that exact variation. Well, we'll see. Okay, it goes knight e6. Queen f8, yeah. queen g7 mate is coming, so that's probably... So I, said, I said knight g5 check, but I forgot about queen f8, queen g6, g7. Queen g5 checkmate in the next couple moves. That is, yeah, I think the only move in this position is queen c8 to prevent queen f8. And that's not a move you tend to want to play when you're down a pawn in an endgame. 
because yes, you were defending the F8 square, but you're also moving backwards and you really want to get some kind of attack going. And I don't mean attack like a checkmating attack, but some kind of aggressive plan with clear ideas and clear threats. Oh man. Queen C8 played. So Queen C7 check would trade queens, but is not advisable because if you trade queens on C7, my king gets to D6 very quickly. And these are the type of situations where you have to realize being up a pawn, we're often told to trade. But sometimes when you trade, when you're only up one pawn, certain end games are more likely to be drawn. So it's a very important yes. lesson. And he's got his hands up and he is singing. It must feel good to win a game. I'm going to do that when I win my <laughs> next... Uh, when I win my, ne <laughs> my next classical game. All right, so knight c6, knight e7, looking very nice. Yep, nice, knight c6, knight c7 looks great. Knight c6, c6 to e5 also similarly looks excellent. But after knight c6, I'm not even sure what Sevian is going to do. Okay. Yeah, I was going to say queen e7 also made some sense. Oh, but queen d7 now. Queen d7 gets the queens off. Yep. And is he going to go knight c6? That'd be funny. Like knight c6, hoping you take me on e7 so my knight can get back to f5. But same exact scenario as before. If you like, just, if we go through this really quickly, mm -hmm. then d5 hangs, and you know I'm down one pawn. Should probably be losing, but at least I have some chances there. Okay, so he takes like this. Uh, knight e5 check is a devastating threat, and otherwise you lose your a pawn. Very nice by Ali Reza. If you play a move like a5, knight e5 check comes in, forcing the knights off the board. So he plays knight c5, which is yeah, good. I'm not, I'm not satisfied, man. I mean, there was a queen on the board. There should have been a checkmate. All right, I guess he's gonna win anyway. But, but there's still some stuff to prove here. Okay, play B, no B5, then D6 happens. That's a problem. Nice move, Knight C8. Very nice move. No B6 is falling. The pawn, the D pawn is just gonna roll down the board, and, uh, and he gets that four. But the A pawn rolls. Yeah, the eight pawn is just rolling eight four eight five. A five. Yep. He's going knight b four, but then even d six d seven could have left the pawn d five as well. But yeah, he's up two pawns in the end game. Should be winning quite in a quite straightforward manner. Yeah, so you can't play a fancy tactic like knight d five right now. That would not. That would not work. Uh, just walk the king. The black king can't get any closer than e6, and then you just play d7. Um, so, well, you know, it's not. No, it's pretty true, though, actually. Yeah, even h4 here just wins on the spot. Mm -hmm. Just give him, like, yeah, there he goes, and then the king gets to f4. So I don't care about, yeah, the double h pawns. You can play h3 to get desperate and hope that Ali Reza blunders that, but Ali Reza is a bullet machine, and so, yeah, he's not going to let you. Swindle him like that. Cheapo. Sevian takes a final think. This is kind of like the most tranquil conclusion we've had. You know, we've had some blistering checkmating attacks, enormous resignation. This one just kind of a just a lost end game. And it's 3 2 Ali Reza. Yep. And we still have 37 minutes left in this segment. Yeah, it like it, it went very slowly at the beginning and then. It sped up, and I, I don't know. I, I was just kind of all over the place with uh, with the timing. At first, I thought we would have maybe 15 minutes to go, but we have so much time, actually. So, Yeah, it's kind of crazy. I mean, if, if I'm being honest, obviously, the three-minute and then the bullet se segment where it's just so fast-paced and you know they don't even have time to think, it's pretty enjoyable as a commentator. But because that first game went so long, it was like 100 and whatever, 20 moves, I just thought that... You know, also the time has just elapsed, but still got 36 minutes, and we have also a Queen's Indian here for uh, Ali Reza, where he's got this bishop on b7 staring down the diagonal of the bishop on g2. And this dynamic usually leads white to play moves like knight to e5 to open up the diagonal for the bishop, but you don't have to do that because black doesn't always want to take on c4 as it allows your knight to get into the center where knight takes c4. But okay, he made up his mind for the both of them by taking on d5. Took back with the pawn to keep e4 under control, and both sides seem happy because they're playing very quickly. Yeah, the players kind of go through this Catalan. I'm not so sure Sam has played a lot of Catalans in his life, but 
Ali Raza has both played against it and played it. Uh, I've actually analyzed some variations. Uh, and then I, I come across Ali Raza's game. Oh, wow, it's Ali Raza. I look at a totally different variation. Oh, wow, it's Ali Raza. Uh, he's <laughs> everywhere with white, with black, purple, doesn't matter. So, uh, yeah, I mean, this, but this one very quickly left the territory of the Catalan and became the CD5, ED5. Uh, really, a lot of chess is going in this direction. Like Knight F3, C4, the double Fianchetto, quadruple Fianchetto sometimes. Yeah, because it's very static, right? Look at the center here. The pawn D5, pawn D4, clearly locked down. Uh, Black has this semi-open E file, but the pawn F2, the base pawn is the F pawn, not the E pawn. For Black, the base pawn is the C pawn, and my rook's on C1 staring at that base pawn, which typically gives white the advantage, and especially in practical terms, because you always have to keep an eye on C7 here, keep an eye on F2, right? Because knight takes F2 is a threat, when knight g4 check is involved winning the e3 pawn. It may not be the most amazing sacrifice, but it's a sacrifice you always should keep an eye on. Here it doesn't do too much, because they pull up an analysis board real quickly. Knight takes f2, I will simply take your knight in f2. I have to, otherwise I'm just giving you free material. And after king takes f2, knight g4 check, I just want king to g1, you take on e3, I simply slide my rook over. You've only gotten two pawns for your piece, which is not sufficient compensation. Oh, but it's such a tempting move. It would be a grandmaster move in Bug House, and that takes up too. Oh, if this is Bug House, I'd be doing that in half a second. Chop on F2, Knight G4, take E3, GG. Uh, how do we how do we feel about the the dynamic between the light squared bishop? So I think it was an Anish Giri article in New in Chess, maybe a year or two ago, where he said that in these kinds of Queen's Indian structures. The bishop on g2 is significantly better than its counterpart on b7 because it's a lot more stable, is what he said, I believe. Um, what do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, firstly, who am I to critique Anish? <laughs> oh, no, actually, I'm the perfect person to critique Anish. I love <laughs> uh, kind of taking jabs at Anish, and well, he loves hitting me with barbs himself. But what I would say about the bishop g2, bishop b7 dynamic is my bishop on g2 stares at a pawn, so it's an aggressive bishop and your bishop defends that pawn, so it's more passive. And my bishop can go to h3 to kick your rook off the c-file, which means that I can use it on a more useful diagonal as is needed. The bishop on b7, if even went to a6, nothing's happening on the a6 f1 diagonal. So uh, you have just more optionality for the bishop. Now e4 is under attack, so you better be very careful. So c3 was played, and... Okay, I wouldn't go ahead and take on e4 because the b2 pawn, you know, sorry, b2 bishop, but I will get a b2 pawn for black, which looks very dangerous. So I'd probably just move bishop a1. What's he, uh, what's he worried about there? If, if we pull up the board, and now it's board again, and maybe bishop takes a3, but then there's queen a2 ideas, hitting f7, hitting a3. But I, I wanted to point out that bishop a3, bishop e4 looks like a free material. But in these kind of situations, I take on c1, you take back, and I go f6. Your knight's actually pinned at the end here, and so um, black is going to go off in exchange. Yeah, bishop a1 looks like a move where black's got to have something. Uh, but where is it? I mean, there's so many things hanging. You always need to be on the lookout for moves like knight d2, c2, bishop takes a3, bishop takes e5, bishop takes e4 from white side. Right. Uh, it's 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 so so tricky. Plus, even I mean, knight takes f two now. Knight takes f two. Let's see. So knight takes f two. My idea is that on king f two, there might be like queen f six, and I can maybe take g two and take e five, like some something like this. That's actually super fascinating, right? Because you protect c three huh. in the process. You know, their ideas with checks on e four, e three is hanging. Yeah, I mean, it looks. Like it shouldn't work, objectively speaking. Or maybe instead of taking on e5, oh, instead of taking on e5, I can play queen c6 and c2. I oh, can check you and fork you. That is something, something there. Let's see if that, no, I took on e5 first, so I'm not even going to be an option. Is he going to queen takes d1, though? Is he going to go d5, queen takes d1, rook takes d1, c2, forking the queen and rook, queen c1 only move, or queen b3. Take, take, and somehow I have to get you on the back rank with like rook d8, and my rooks are just coming down to the uh, second rank. This looks terrible for white. 
Wow. Okay, wait a second. Wait a second. So he wants the sacrifice? Wait, but Robert, at the end of the variation, you could block the attack, can't you? On your on your queen with bishop d4. That's the downside of all of this, is that he's letting the a1 bishop get back into the game. Uh, so maybe, maybe rook d is not precise, but I feel like there's some move here that should no, lack something. But maybe but, you're right. No, but I mean... Yeah, like... Well, so, no, Sevian, Sevian believes it. He believes the bluff. Well, this also might be good for white because you're evening the material again and you're going to win C... Oh, I forgot G3 was hanging. Never mind. I was like, oh, this yeah. might be good for white because I'm going to get your C pawn. But you took on G3. That's a problem. He believed him. That's that. That was that was the problem there. He just he bought into uh, he bought into Farouche's hype. <laughs> Ali Reza, man, just such a believable character. It doesn't seem like a lying type. Psychologically rattling his opponents. But okay, this is a clear pawn now. Very clear pawn. And Queen H4 just picks up the E4 pawn as well because H2 is mate and E4 is hanging. I guess Queen H4. You'll play Queen G2 to protect against. Oh, that doesn't work either. Queen H4, Queen G2, Bishop takes H2 check takes queen g4 check i take on d1 with check thank you for the free material yeah uh, this is this is a really really desperate situation for black i mean white can push uh excuse me for white uh, white can push forward uh with moves like e5 but uh <laughs> actually would that would be the best response for sure after queen h4 is e5 yeah i mean just just try to do something Try try to try to find something on the board, but uh, you know it's, it's just B five here, B four. I, I would say, I would say Levy that White might have pretty good chance to survive, even if I give up a second pawn with your idea E five, because it might take a lot of energy to win my D pawn, and if I can win both of your queenside pawns for my D pawn and get a you know three on two on the king side, that provides pretty good drawing chances in many lines. That's. Fair point. Fair point. I, I'm I'm very, very much happy with the A and the B pawns for now, and also in the future with the capabilities to play moves like B5, B4 with tempo, A4. You know, pawns on A5 and B6 don't necessarily give off like the scariest impression, but once they get to B4 and A4, it's a very different story. Yeah, <laughs> completely agreed. Completely agreed. If those pawns can. Um, can, yep. can pull down the board, you're in huge trouble. And E4 being so weak is a huge problem. B5? <laughs> just okay, A4, fine. B5 also possible. Yeah, he's just pushing that pawn real quick. Is A3 just a good move here? Probably, yeah. He doesn't have to I highly doubt he has to buy. Okay, Queen E7 makes sense. Wait, E4, but well, yeah, you just said, right? Rook B6. Yeah, wait, this feels like a, a misguided move. Because that... Wait, what? Yeah, I don't know what's is, going on. Is this going to be close to a draw's rook end game? This is exactly what I was talking about. Rook takes d6. He might try throwing bishop takes f6 here. I'm not sure if that's good. It looks like an option. Yeah, what else I'm surprised about? Uh, the move on command says that you can follow her. So you and I have had our gender pronouns look, Robert. <laughs> So yeah. Also, they added an I to my name, so they're 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 trying to make me they're trying to make me sound <laughs> fancy. Rosmani, kind of like that. <laughs> I kind of like that. I dig it. I, I dig it too. And this end game is going to be a draw now. So, so I I think Ali Reza went went wrong. You think so? Yeah, he's going to uh, get his tape on. I I've done some Arena Kings commentary, and I've watched some of your end game battles. I think I've watched like three or four rook end games that you've had against Ali Reza. I'm always cheering for you. Shall we? Am I allowed to say that? I'm always cheering for good chess. <laughs> um, so yeah, obviously here there's a trick. Like you could play d8 queen, and then take on a4. Uh, but there's, I think he's also kind of waiting to see if maybe Alireza might blunder with a move like king f4, and then rook takes a4 and you lose. Yep. That didn't happen. But wow, good save. Yeah. Very good save, and I, and I was calling this a while back, right? If you give up the queenside pawns with the D pawn and the E pawn, the three on two is not looking like a winning end game. Although now you have to be very careful. Rook D two check, and don't go to H three. Wait, why not? Because you go to H three, and Rook F two happens, and you lose that pawn with check. No, but I thought Rook A three, and I can still like continue. Oh, yeah, that's true. Actually, there's also stalemate, right? You just sacrifice your rook. 
that's actually so cool. Pull up the analysis board, and we will just show what I, you know, what I want. So if you go like you run the king to h6, all right. So eventually you'll like run this king to h6 because you run out of checks at some point. And then if if you like go rook to f2, I have no moves for my king, so I can just sacrifice my rook on g6 um, with check and say it's stalemate once you take me back. Oof, filthy. The crazy rook. Yeah, and so instead we just got a ton official. of checks. Okay, well, we might see that exact stalemate. That's why you didn't go rook f2. Uh, it is, though, right now in favor of Ali Reza to waste a bunch of time. Uh, there was a famous 1-1 game that Hikaru played against Wesley So in the finals of last year's PHS Championship, the main event. And it was an opposite color bishop end game that Hikaru played for 170 moves. Yeah. So completely insane. Uh, and he got like two or three minutes off the clock, and he was winning the match. So when you have a timer like this, every minute you burn in a situation where you're winning, it's, uh, it's, it's part of the game. It's part of the match strategy. Some people don't like it, but you know, it's, uh, it's smart. And, and well, having said that, Farouge also has three seconds on the clock. So. Yeah, he might not want to lose in time. That would be very tragic. Yep. Instead, we just have them repeating... Currently at 84 moves. Yes, it's 100% stalling. He's he's not necessarily even stalling as much as he is. Well, he's de he's definitely stalling, but he's it's it's more like well maybe when Sevian gets below like eight seconds, seven seconds, something drastic will happen. I I'll trade a pawn. We'll play another 50 moves. I'll push a pawn. Another 50 moves. So I'm uh, impressed by Sevian's mouse speed right now. Yep. So everybody in chat is like, this is ridiculous, and chess is stupid. Listen, it's match strategy. Well, already a minute has gone off the clock. Wait, wait, wait. Why do you go behind the pawn like that? That was so unnecessary. Yeah, that was that was over the top. I mean, obviously, it's still a draw. Um, Robert, is he going to play? Is he going to just trade? Okay, he just trades. I thought, yeah, I thought maybe he would. Okay. <laughs> that was That was something. Thought so maybe we were going to see King and Rook against King and Rook. Yeah, I, I mean, it's, it is smart play by Ali Reza because as we've gone through this five minute segment, we've seen that Sevian is a very good match for Ali Reza. And Ali Reza said, I'm the favorite in the, he thinks he's a favorite in all three time patrols, but particularly the bullet, um, which is interesting because Sevian was such a monster in the bullet against Nihal Sara. And I think that if I am Ali Reza, I know how good Sevian is. And I, and I know how much bullet that Ali Reza himself plays, so I would kind of gear the match, steer it towards the quicker time patrols, because I think that those is where Ali Reza has his biggest advantage. I'll also say that it's really interesting. A lot of these junior players, they mix it up. They very rarely will play the exact same opening two games in a row. I mean, every yeah. game so far, we've had something interesting. Even though we had a Rui Lopez, this one is more of a... Steinitz, old Steinitz with D6, G6, right? Almost like a King's Indian feel to the position, which we know Ali Reza specializes in. Uh, well, well, we'll see how this one develops, but every game has brought unique feel. In your opinion, would you take that approach? Would you play kind of a different iteration of perhaps a Rui Lopez or, or an opening? Or would you just literally play the exact same thing? Is that kind of frustrating to your opponent in its own right? It's very opponent dependent because some of the players in the JCC are kind of opening theoreticians and they know their stuff really well. Others are more just all over the place. So if I'm playing Ali Reza, I think that maybe I try to stick to a couple main lines, but considering what he just did the other game um, where he played the McShane Dominguez game, just move for move until he, you know, there's a deviation. He won. Clearly he's up to speed with some of the topical lines. So I, I really think it's, Against Sevian, I would try to mix it up. Against Ali Reza, I think I would be more likely to play main lines. But that said, every time I play Ali Reza, I play some kind of random opening. So maybe I do as I say, not as I do kind of situation. Well, I, I will say this. I don't know how many of you know about this. Um, but in the most recent uh, New in Chess, uh, there was an article by Maxime Blugi, the Blitz Whisperer, where you know he kind of talks about some of his experiences playing online, but a lot probably analyzes some interesting games. But it was basically a hit piece <laughs> on the world's leading junior players. 
it was basically an article that uh, that that talked about how he doesn't think that they're up, they are living up to their hype. So one of the things that he talked about was he doesn't think that Ali Reza is super familiar with how Bobby Fischer used to crush you know the dragon or you know attack on the king side. So uh, I I don't know how you could break down the weaknesses in Ali Reza's play. We've seen him be well versed. We've seen him play end games, but what the last game he didn't win a better position in an end game, Robert. Is that, is that what the young guys got to work on? No, I'm going to ignore the Deleuze <laughs> article. Um, they're, they're just different, totally different caliber of blitz players. And I understand that Deleuze uh, is an amazing blitz player. He's really, really strong, and he used to be relatively even stronger, uh, for sure. Like, he was one of the top blitz players in the world, but Ferugia is right now is on a different level, so it's not even worth really talking about too much, in my opinion, because one of those players I have a very good score against online uh, the other, I absolutely do not. So I'll let you figure out which is which. All right. Sounds good. That's the professional approach. Sorry if I'm uh, muckraking a little bit here. No, I mean, <laughs> I, I, I read that article too, by the way. So it was just ridiculous. <laughs> it was just a way of like, very typical, like making you know someone look bad for your own benefit, which is just not really my kind of article. So it's, uh, I, w I wish that article didn't exist or I wish it was said in a more positive manner of like this guy's really truly a monster but here are some things potentially he can work on but it wasn't it wasn't done in a constructive way in my opinion robert the uh, the next the next one's gonna have like a mugshot of you and then it's gonna say robert s not familiar with multiple pre-move function on phone Speaking <laughs> of which, we got we got to get that at some point you know robert and i are phone bullet guys so it's uh oh and i just see in the chat in the game chat we've got international master wonderful time that's tuan min lei who actually was the hero of the Summer League Pro Chess League series for Pittsburgh. And he helped them make that third spot in Group B. If you guys aren't watching the Summer League, you're really missing out. It's quite exciting. Uh, uh, I'm watching the Summer League. Did you see Zion Williamson playing? Oh, you're talking <laughs> about different, different Summer yeah, League. Yeah, we're talking about different. So, sorry. It's a chess bad. Summer League, guys. Sorry. My bad. So, uh, I don't like Black's queenside structure. Yeah, and I actually like Wonderful Time's comment here. Well, I don't like it because of the content, but I think it's accurate. Sevian is having some problems with the black pieces. I completely agree. Uh, it does look like he's struggling uh, in, in this one a bit because of the queen side, as you mentioned. At some point, a4 will be a bit annoying. Black's queen and bishop on the diagonal make it seem like you're going to take on h3, and you should absolutely consider it. I mean, should I do it right now? Wait a second. Yeah, knight f3, bishop, well, knight f3, bishop h3, I thought. And Dude, then, what about bishop h3 right now? What are you well, going to do? Yeah, or, or even Robert, it's a common idea, right? g5, g4, or something like this. That looks also plausible, especially because your bishop has to go to g3. Right. Then I can even consider taking it there. Right. Um, strange, very strange. And actually, if we go back a move and bring up the analysis board, you're right, Levy, that maybe even bishop g7 was inaccurate and the move g5 should have been played immediately because then I take on e5, rook e5, bishop g3. I just take on g3, and now I'm lo look at your pawns. You have an isolated e pawn. I can go bishop e6 to trade bishops off the board. My rook on e5 is phenomenal. Your e4 pawn is still weak. Your g Both your g pawns, not the best. So that was an opportunity for Sevian there. And right now, you know, bishop e6, so he just goes to trade the bishops off, and I guess he'll trade them first and then play for g5. But I'm still undecided about bishop takes h3 like if you take take queen h3 there is black the one who is getting the attack and going for a checkmate or is white going to just drop the bishop back to g3 and say once we get into this position all of a sudden we have a piece for three pawns oh wait c3 is hanging that would be a fourth pawn but then i don't know i don't know what to calculate here yeah Firuja, i think Firuja at this point knows that chad is getting a kick out of the singing uh, what I will say is that from the first two or three games of this match, when Sevian has had a tremendous time management, he's done very, very well, played well with low time on the clock, even that first game, as chaotic as it was, Sam Sevian, uh, as, as far as I know, is kind of known not for time trouble, but for having low time on the clock in classical chess. Uh, he's been down on the clock uh, a lot. <laughs> yeah. Uh, he likes to think. And while well, it pays off, he's 2670. But, you know, 50 seconds to two and a half minutes, even if your position is better, doesn't mean anything. It, it really doesn't. It doesn't matter. It's very easy to click that little button up there over the game and go, oh, it's minus 0.8. Duh. But how? 
you've got 45 seconds to figure it out. And you only get one second bonus. Remember, this isn't Title Tuesday. It's not 3-2, and it's not 5-5 five, five or some other blitz format when you repeat a couple of times, and now you have more time on the clock. Uh, it's very easy to go wrong. It's very easy to make the wrong plan. Did you see the quote there? I once forgot to press the clock and flagged versus Vidit. It was then I considered quitting. That's <laughs> Speaking of time management yes. and making the right moves, pressing your clock, you don't have to do that online, of course, but in over-the-board chess, you do have to, of course, push the clock. And right now, I like what sevin has been doing here. He's been gaining the upper hand in the last series of moves. G5 is going to happen whether Frugia likes it or not, and he won't like it when it happens because that puts the bishop on G3. And if you put the bishop on G3, well, you can't take back with the F-pawn. So maybe um, Frugia Alireza should even consider playing a move like G4 himself. I don't like it. I think it's very risky, but sometimes you got to risk it to get the biscuit. Absolutely. He's got a bishop on H4 that hasn't moved for maybe about 20 moves now. I think he moved it there around move 10, and it's still there. Uh, it's doing a job of patrolling some squares, but more than anything, it feels like a target. It really does. And I like that move too. Bishop F8, hitting A3, threatening Bishop D6 with check. This is going really well for... Oh, gosh. That cannot be a very good move, my opinion. But maybe it's... Yeah, that just... Looks so weak. Oh, E5. Is the knight somehow going to get trapped in the center of the board? If it does get trapped, then you're happy. If it doesn't get trapped, well, then you just allow my knight to kind of prance around the board. It's going back to e7. Right, that's that's the idea. It's going back to e7. Or, okay, there it is. Uh, the queen can't move from d2 so easy because f2 will need to be guarded. c6 is hanging. Well it's, done. Yeah. Well done. So, if you, you take on e7, bishop takes e6. Oh, h6 is hanging there. i got to be careful. Well, this is great. I, I mean, again, huge credit to, to Sevian. He's, he's done this throughout the, the day. He's managed good positions with low time on the clock. It's obviously, uh, you know, it's obviously something that he's worked on. <laughs> so G5 here? Okay, when Rook D5, I want to move my Knight, but knight, rook, rook D5 is very good. The Knight is still pinned on D4. The E5 pawn is now hanging. Uh, the Queen needs to go mid Queen E3 just to keep everything safe. Right? The knight's protected. The rook and e6 is now under attack. Oh, queen e3 just... Oh, and then just rook takes e5. Ugh. Rook e5, yeah, but... No, and you've always got bishop d6 stuff coming, right? Like, knight... Or g5, knight g6, bishop d6. The pieces all come alive. Yeah, the c6 pawn is under attack as well. The thing is, when it gets bad, it gets really bad. It's not that there's one main line of victory and that's it. It's just that the position is really bad. <laughs> Yep. Semyon, wow, storming back. I think we'll have time for one more game. I think really this game will wrap up and then at most two, but probably just one. Yeah, Semyon also can take on d4 if he needs to. Like rook d4 and take on c6 for the knight, then a3 is hanging. But here he can just go ahead and take on e5. And with the time trouble, the queen I think is going to be too strong, but he needs to move quickly. Knight takes c6. I All right, everybody, buckle up. 15 seconds per player. Oh, but knight c6 is rook d8 at the end. So take, take, rook d8, or king g7, he gets out. Okay. Oh, rook e8. Bishop d6 is checked. Very importantly, there's a check so you don't get mated along the back rank. But then you go g5 and the f6 square for your king. Yep. So, okay, now you don't even need to go g5 because the bishop no longer covers f6, which means queen f3 threatens the f2 pawn. This is nerve-wracking. Sevian's got four seconds. So does Ali Reza, five seconds. Three, two. Okay, queen f2. You can gain time whenever you want. Someone says missed mate. Who missed me? No one missed me. Nobody missed me, guys. I think they forgot the king on h2 was in check before. So check. Uh, take on h a3 even. Ah, uh, okay, that's good. Take on here. Take on g4. Yep. Game over. It How many extra two, pawns is it? It's uh, six extra pawns. <laughs> is that enough? Uh, it's never enough, Robert. It's never enough. Is six bagels enough? I mean, I'm pretty hungry, so I think... I think uh, six is too much. But not, four? Not, not in a sitting, in a week. Oh, in a week? No, then I can do that for sure. Yeah, obviously. All right, a second. A second uh, oh, are we going to? I'm making a bold prediction. We might see DC B5. Queen C2 B5. Okay, he goes for this line. But if we saw Queen C2 B5, like Magnus just beat Ding Lira, and that would have been very fun. Yeah, and a really risky line that probably shouldn't be played that much, but Magnus is Magnus, so you can do it. Yeah, and Magnus detonates a complete novelty never before seen ever in the world and says that uh, it's preparation for Fabiano. 
I oh it's this line queen d6 and then queen a6 right? right queen goes to a6 which looks very strange once again but because the bishop is on the g2 b7 diagonal the queen on a6 is useful in defending b7 your queen doesn't get under attack from over there um so it's actually something that Ali Reza can get away with not just Ali Reza it's not like oh Ali Reza did it he can get away with it it's what black in general can play in a position like this so queen a6 um is always in the cards this is quite standard because Savion spent a bit of time on knight a3, but this is just standard Catalan pressure. Yep. And if you take on d4, so we'll see a trace. Bishop e3 will be with tempo. Actually, I think just queen c2. Queen b3, queen c2. So uh, then queen b3. Makes even more sense. Okay, he, he does this. I mean, I, I actually think that it's it's easier to target the queen than it is, like, a rook. I mean, I, this almost goes to show, like, what if black just plays knight d5? So this is the, yeah, this is the thing. Uh, I've recently started adopting like you know these kind of nimso anti catalans into my repertoire. For for a long time, I didn't like playing against the Catalan because who does? You just suffer <laughs> pressure. And I was like, well, these positions where you can block this bishop, trade the pawns in the center, not so bad. And in a lot in a lot of positions, you can play moves like f6, for example, like now maybe f6 e5 bishop e6 c6 knight and just get everything out, and then you're happy. Okay, knight is fine. Also good, but uh... knight a five here is a possibility. It's one of those positions where, like, you have a big problems getting your bishop on c eight out. Um, I mean, like knight a five also has ideas of knight to c six at the right moment if you're not careful. But yeah, I, I agree with you though, Levy. I think that um, in general, when you have the extra pawn for black, you have to be both very careful because you're generally speaking not developed very well, but for white, you just say, well, how am I going to get my pawn back? And a lot of players do not play gambit openings for that very reason. They don't like saying that I have to be a pawn down for the next 20 moves and be okay with it. Because most people are not okay with being down material. They really want to restore material equality. But oftentimes you can restore material equality when you have an extra pawn. It's like, here's that pawn, take it back, but my position is better, has improved. So, yeah. yeah. I, I, like I said, I, I don't think Sebian is extremely experienced in, in in, in these Catalan positions, which, I mean, they're, they're tough to play. You're not super experienced. Uh, being down a pawn and not having clear targets, because black looks very solid. If you just play a couple of good moves, then every, everything looks okay. But having said that, it's also not a walk in the park to get out of this pressure. A couple of not, not so good moves, and I mean, it's, it's very bad. White is also extremely solid, so we'll see what happens. There's definitely rook takes c6 as an idea here. I don't think it works, but I would, you know, consider rook c6, b c6, knight takes c6, huh. everything hanging. The whole, oh, it's getting even more tempting by the move, but I, I does it work? It can't work. No. Rook c6. Well, no, not now because the knight actually defends d5, right? So you, before you were threatening bishop d5 and knight e7. Right. But if we pull up like an analysis board real quick, you know, if I take on c6 and you take back and I take with my knight, so I'm taking your rook on b8, mm -hmm. full free. If I can get e4 in, I'm kicking your knight away from b5 where it protects the uh, e7 bishop. And so it's like maybe you have rook b6 to get out of it. And that probably does the trick because I take on d8 you take with the bishop. And I want to move both my minor pieces away from the d file, like knight c5 and bishop somewhere in one move, but I don't have that option. So. It's uh, probably not quite there yet. Looks like, according to the timer and the game clock, we this will be the last game. So it's three and a half, three and a half. Well, a peaceful resolution would mean it's all it's all locked going into three one. Interesting fact though is that the stats team has predicted that the largest margin of victory for, for Ali Reza across all three time controls is going to be in three one, which is interesting. Considering he's arguably one of the best bullet players on planet Earth, uh, but I guess you know one one and the fact that it's a match and not a random session at three a.m. with music playing, streaming, etc. Uh, you know, it's it kind of skews the margin a little bit. And the other thing is that that that, that I find oh yeah whoa that I find the most troubling here is that uh, losing the last game with white that's rough. I mean, you would much rather have a draw, right? So, yeah. Wow, this is so. Wait, four pawns for the piece here. How about this game, Robert, to to get out of here? We we, we might have another game. 
we might have another game after all. So I'm trying to figure out if knight c5 ideas can actually pan out because if you know we go knight c5 and you take and I take, we're walking right into b6, but then I might have rook c6 attacking with bishop on e6. So it's like I don't think it is good enough, and he would bishop e1 for good reason because they're always like bishop g4 moves to attack my rook engine one. But knight c5 is an idea that I'm keeping in mind, especially because his pawn on b7 is hard to move because anytime you touch it, my one of my pieces is getting into the c6 square. Well, yeah, I mean, black is just very, very calm. He puts the pawn on a3, and it's not so easy for white to make any moves. So what about knight c5 here? Knight c5. Uh, I take, take. And you want to go b6, I know that, but I yeah. don't think it pans out. So that, that's my idea, right? Like, So if we pull up the... Uh, the board again, the good old fashioned analysis board where you know, make a move like knight to c5 because we're going right after the b7 pawn, we're going after the bishop on e6. You take c5, I take back. You want to go b6 with a fork, but maybe I can even consider taking on d5 in a position like this. Rook c6 is now an even clearer option. And very importantly, I'm getting rid of black's dark square bishop, which makes the pawn on a3 more vulnerable. He so he's in knight five. Yeah, he, he's calculating all this. And look at that quick play. By Ali Reza, expecting it. Oh, A2. So he's saying if you take on D5, I take back, you take back. And then the problem is, is A pawn is queening. So if the rook takes, rook takes, well, thank you for the new queen. Yeah, there's just going to be a, a queen on the board. So, I mean, well, what if I just go rook A1? Okay, rook CC1 also makes sense. Really lock down the A1 spot. And now B6 cannot be played once more because then knight C6, your knight on D5 doesn't have access to the very important B4 C3 squares to try to help that pawn push because my bishop when you want is perfectly placed. What's Black's move here, actually? You can't move uh, the knight without losing b7. That's why he's thinking. I'm, I'm not sure he knows what his next move is. I'm not sure I know what his next move is. Uh, does trading the rooks help or hinder Black's chances? Probably hinders, but... But you do protect your a2 pawn, right? If you move that knight away from d5, that's the good news. Yes, that is true. Uh... <laughs> Nope, never mind. I say, what about bishop f5 to b1? But bishop f5 <laughs> hangs the knight on d5. Fall free. Okay, so he does back up. Uh, now, well, we can trade a rook. We can trade nothing. I like this. Uh, rook b8 and rook b1? My bishop protects b7, so... Oh! <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Hello. But, but maybe I, you know, I get a little stuck as well. Well, yeah, my next move was bishop d5. That was sort of my idea. So rook. Uh, rook where? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I could also just move through your knight, just play rook b1. A little coffee house online action. Right, but this is a really devastating threat. And bishop c3 is not the type of move you want to play here. Hmm. Uh oh, for Sam. It's no good. I mean, hey, if I'm, if I'm paying attention to the game clock, I want another game. Like, do you, do you just throw in the towel here and try to play one more game? That's a great question. I think if he's going to lose, he'll lose pretty quickly just because, you know, it doesn't seem like there's much of a fight left in most of these variations. So rook a1 played, bishop d5, as you suggested. Yeah, this, this is, well, bishop d5, now you can maybe take and... Oh, no. Yeah, that you, could take, you could take, move the knight, take a2, and give up the bishop on e1, and then a7 is still a problem. Oh, that's actually a really good call. So you're saying just knight d5 here? So, uh, no, yeah, uh, like, yeah, like, like, maybe, maybe, maybe. But see, um, I don't know. See, this, this is a very tough situation. Obviously, you know you're worse. Well, maybe not. Maybe he doesn't think he's that much worse. But do you just throw in the towel and just start playing one more game? I, don't know. I think you, there's still a minute and, what, 15 seconds left, so I still play it a little bit and... You know, if I realize I'm completely losing, get that last few seconds and then play another game, probably. Um, so he went there, knight d5. Okay, we're, we're, we're nearing a minute. I mean, I think this will be the last game. I highly doubt we see a result in the next minute. But depending on if Sevian is aware of the game time situation, he could resign when it gets untenable and go for another game. Because the thing is, he probably will lose. Yeah. That's the thing. I mean, like... Very, very unlikely he saved this. So oh, that's a good start to try to save this game. Rook v1, right? 
Okay, now the knight moves and bishop c4 check somewhere is like knight f4 here it looks devastating. Okay, there's 30 seconds. What will he decide? Knight f4, do it. It's winning on second. Yeah, I mean 30 seconds for Perugia, but also 30 seconds in the in the situation. I mean, there he's gonna resign or lose on time. Okay, knight takes g2 and then he's gonna resign. He resigns he and he gets one more game. Give him that game. There it is. There it is. Beat it out. He got the game with just seconds on the clock. This could be huge if he wins. It could be huge. Wow. And I wonder if that's good for him or not, because like when you have the black pieces, are you more likely to draw or hold in a five-minute game or a three-minute game? Well, he just won. I mean, right? Didn't he just, he just won a game with black? So, and he won the first game with black. Yeah. I mean, Seven that, won the first game. Yeah. Yeah, that game was insane, but... <laughs> You know, he won it, and he, he was doing very well. So he goes back to the set of, hey, he wins this game. It's a huge match decision. Uh, so we, we definitely got to ask him if he's aware. He takes a sip of his, I think that's carbonated water. I love it. We got to do a little bit more work, but, I mean, it's all good. We get a full <laughs> game of 10 to 15, you know, 10 to 15 minutes of chess right with uh, – so. Yeah, they're making our day longer. Well, that, you know, chat brings up a good point. When we say he got one more game – who are we really talking, you know, who does that benefit? That's a great uh, question. I don't know. Um, I, I want to say the more games you play, the better it is, right? Well, it's definitely better for the fans, that's for sure. But who, yeah, it's a great question. Lovey, I'm going to ask you, I'm going to put you on the spot. Who gets, who is it, um, gets the advantage of playing an extra five-minute game? Do you think this game... You know, we, we obviously can see the position on the board, but it's, it's you know, still early, relatively level. Let's call it that. Who is gaining from this extra game in the five-minute segment? Well, more games favor the stronger player, but I, I'm I, I'm not convinced who, who that is between the two. I mean, they were just deadlocked. They've been deadlocked. The match has been going back and forth. Uh, it's very easy to say, well, you know, everybody knows who Ali Reza is, but it, it's not a popularity contest at the end of the day. Right. It's still 30, 40 points separating their ELO. Even if one guy is a slight favorite, okay, sure. Maybe that means that Sam wants less games, but you're not just going to let it go and then immediately go to 3 1. Be happy with that. You want to get a game back, and you just won two games with black. So, what does that say? Another game with black? Why not? You yeah. just have two, two out of your three and a half points with the black pieces with wins. So, let's do it. Is that so? I'm trying to remember the second game. Oh, yeah. So he won the first game and he won that game a couple games ago with Black, where the Queen from two rows. You're right. You're absolutely right. Um, so seven should be. He's more, more points with the Black pieces than he does with White. And you're absolutely right here. Ferruja has a choice between A4 ideas and C4 ideas. Um, I'm not really sure. I would play A4, but then I'm like, okay, D5 for Black. We were talking about the Sicilian, how D5 is a common move to that you're always trying to play for black in this version of the Rey Lopez, the Spanish, it's kind of like a Sicilian because black has given up the C pawn for the D pawn. And so it has some elements similar to a Spanish, uh, excuse me, to a Sicilian and D5 being one of them. Yeah, D5. We saw one of the early, yeah. early games, Ali Reza played an early D5 break like this and it made the game uh, very complicated. But... Okay, I, wait, what if Savion plays D4? I, I'm very, wow. Knight D6. Also, I can see the chessboard in Savion's glasses. Have you noticed that? You can ah. see green. So Savion and I must get our, must get our glasses from the same, from the same <laughs> place because my glare on my glasses is, is unbelievable. <laughs> so, yep. Yeah, all right. I mean, he brings the knight D6. It makes perfect sense, right? Just protect the E4. Knight g3, bring another attacker. These are the type of positions where white may get the pawn back. I feel like black has to be favorable. Like, I'm like rook c8, saying that if we start trading on e4, your c3 pawn is going to fall in the process. Yeah, or, or yeah, like rook c8, queen c7, so maybe hit c3 in the future. Or even at the end of all these exchanges. <laughs> queen c7, yeah, you might force your uh, other reason to take on f6, and then white, sorry, black gets the two bishops. Yep. That's right. Bishop f6 is sort of what you're invested in with white. You're, we've seen Ali Reza have a dark scored bishop that didn't quite quite find a home in several games. Um, 
Okay, we see your move. Rook C8 from Sevion. That's probably a good thing. Yep. Look at the time situation, by the way. An extra 50 seconds for Sevion. He's ready for this. I'm telling you, if he wins this game, it's going to be an enormous decision. Like, that that strategically will really, really pay off. Uh, but we'll see what happens. I mean, he's up a minute on the clock now. He's got a great position. Well, it helps to be a lifelong E45 guy, though. <laughs> yep. Shout out to uh, user Prokma, gifting a sub to the community. Remember, everybody, that on Saturdays, Shaz.com Twitch channel does a sub Saturday event with a, with a special guest every week. And it changes up. So the host, usually a GM, IM player, will play against viewers, talk about your game. Uh, depending on the host, you will hear a you know, plethora of insults or compliments. It really depends who it is. <laughs> uh, if it's MVL, probably your games will be shredded. Well, we'll see what happens. Um, yeah, just like this two bishops. Like long term, the bishop on G7 will be a huge asset. The H5, bishop H6, right? Stuff like that. F5. E4. Yeah, uh, the, the only issue that black generally has in a position like this is if a knight gets to c5, but you have a dark score bishop that you can put on f8 to keep a knight from there. So, okay, we're going to get opposite color bishops. Um, c3 is hanging, like right now. So, is queen takes e5 possible here? Queen e5, rook d. Queen e5, <laughs> So, I think queen e5 was possible, but. Oh, no, the bishop on c2 was hanging. No, queen uh, e5, rook d8. No? Uh, queen e5, rook c2, excuse me, that's what I'm saying. And then rook d8. Ah, uh, yes, the rook bishop hanging. And I was like looking at all the other captures, but after queen takes e5, that was the simplest. Okay, getting to the live board. Uh-oh. Wait, why did he just give away g6? Oh, he protected f7 and forgot g6 was hanging. And Ali Reyes is bouncing. <laughs> yeah, Ali Reyes, oh, man. Okay, we were, we were really hyping it up, but... Uh... This, this could come back to hurt if you lose this one. You're going to be down two games. It looked like we were heading for a draw if White was able to hold. I mean, a draw was down a pawn despite having active pieces. But this is bad. This looks like, though, at the very least, Black can probably force the draw with Rook C1 check and Queen F4 ideas. Right? Like, if you're Rook F1 for White, then, like, Rook F1, I'll take on B4, and everything's protected. F7's covered, um, you know. Your queen on g6 can only stay there for so long. If they rook b1, with the idea of being you're protecting b4 through a check on f7, then after rook b1, I have rook c1 check and that exact draw that I was talking about. Whoa. Whoa. Well, rook, c1, rook c1, queen f2, right? Well, that's we got to pull up the analysis board here because rook c1, queen f2 is probably what Ali Reza is looking at in detail. Rook c1, king h2, queen f2, rook f3, queen g1 check. King G3, and is the king actually safe over here on G3? Because I am threatening to go win on this F7 pawn in like three different ways. Mm. Well, there's Queen E1. Queen E1, and if I have King G4, I guess you just take my pawn on B4, and after King H5, where it looks like my king's safe, I have Queen takes B3, removing the pin on the F7 pawn, threatening pawn takes G6. Oh, queen, queen B3 is disgusting. Yeah. Oh, yeah, th things are flying off the board now. So you went queen d1 check? So he just said, um, all right, let's get back to the live board. And he went queen d1, and now he took the queen. But OK, what's going on here? Even material. White's pawn structure is better. It feels like he's going to play this forever and ever and ever <laughs> and ever. And ever and ever and ever and ever. And OK, let's see. How does, but what's Black's easiest way to sort of try to hold the point? I don't actually see, but it's bishop f6. I don't want really to see a breakthrough for white. That's very clear. Uh, but I do like white's position, relatively speaking. Well, rook d7 and maybe rook d4. That's, that's looking like a real option. All right. Well, there we go. <laughs> By the way, if this one ends in a draw, then the, then the smarter chess match prediction will be completely correct. Don't give him credit. <laughs> He'll be so happy. Uh-oh. Okay, just gonna draw like this. Uh, I get, yeah, I guess it's, it's quite easy, right? Because the, yep. All right, let's get all those pieces off the board. Bishop c3, bishop takes e4, g5. You don't want to give too many pawns on one side of the board. Yep, take on b4, or play a5, it doesn't really matter. 
And the reason why this is such an easy draw is, well, many reasons. One, look at the dark square, h8 corner, in the light square bishop, which means that if I leave white with the bishop in the, and just the h pawn, it's still a draw, which is important to note in case something sort of crazy happens. Um, I don't think we're going to get to that point, but it is an important one to keep in mind. It's good also not to get your king too far away. I mean, white can create some phantom winning chances with the centralized king and maybe f4 push in the future. Bishop c5 is smart, though. Yeah, it keeps the king tied down to the pawn. Yeah, he's making an easy draw now. He just Bar got his... how, how does how does a how does a New York slice of pizza sound right now? Oh, it doesn't just sound great. I don't I don't I don't know what it is. Sometimes your New York radar goes off. And you're like, I just, just want like a nice. What's your favorite slice? Just one slice, like my favorite pizza place in New York. Nah, nah your favorite slice. All right, we got a draw. All right, we we can talk pizza on the break. Sorry, y'all. It's gonna be a private conversation. <laughs> And so we conclude the 5-1 portion of the first quarter final, the Junior Speech Chess Championship, with the predicted scoreline of 5-4. to four. We'll be right back. Don't go anywhere. The 3-1 portion is coming up. Official Random Chess, a game where creativity is king and memorization impossible. 960 different back rank configurations turn the world's best chess players into mere competitors trying to outwit and outclass each other with every unprepared move. 
Only one will be worthy of the title, official random chess champion. But the best part is, that champion could be you. The Fisher Random Chess Championship will be unlike any tournament ever held. With a global qualification system, for the first time ever, everybody truly has a chance to prove themselves the best player in the world at a chess variant. Are you a chess artist worthy of the 11th World Champion's admiration? We're going to find out. The tournament features open qualifiers beginning on April 28th and the title player qualifier stage beginning in June. Over $300,000, Fabiano Caruana, Hikaru Nakamura, and world champion Magnus Carlsen await you at the later stages. The Fisher Random Chess Championship title is there for the taking. Will you make a run at it? Go to frchess.com today to register, and stay tuned to chess.com for all the latest news and updates regarding this historic event. It's the FIDE World Fisher Random Chess Championship, organized by Dune AS and chess.com. Welcome back, everybody, to the Junior Speed Chess Championship quarterfinal. Today, we have Ali Reza Perugia and Sam Sevian, who have just completed the first segment of the show. One and a half hours of 5-1 blitz. The scoreline is as predicted, actually. Maybe not in your hearts, but according to the metrics, 5-4 for Ali Reza. Game is about to get underway here of 3 plus 1. Robert, what can we expect in this next segment of games? You know, I've actually been quite impressed with Sam Sevian because I do view Farouge as the favorite before the match even started. When you asked me that question, I said, you know, Ali Reza, have to go with him. But I think that Sevian's been pretty well on the clock in certain games. There have been a few where he's gone down to like 45 seconds versus two minutes, which is not a good uh, idea against someone like Ali Reza. But look right now, right? Just here, they're both blitzing out their openings and it's getting sharp. We're getting into this Richter Rouser structure where Black has these double pawns in the F file and gets the dark square bishop in return. But where does that bishop go? Usually it's behind a wall of white pawns, and so you don't get freedom for that piece. And Levy, well, mm -hmm. five to four in front, favoring Ali Reza. What do you think so far? Of the match or what we have coming up? Just you know, so far, and what well, what do you think? How do you think this match is gonna keep going from this point out? I I'm always really nervous for Sevian. I'm not going to lie. I was, I was nervous for him during the, the, uh, the Nihal Sarin match as well because I mean, you can only go by what's in front of you. I, mean, I know that he's a really, really good and experienced player, but at the end of the day, like online is an entirely different field. The same in like poker, for example, where online and in person are, are different things, really, at the end of the day. I mean, I, I know you're playing the same game, uh, but there's a, there's a different element of concentration. And so he was able to overcome Nihal Saran in many ways, especially in that bullet segment. But Ali Reza, as the time gets slower, man, <laughs> Robert, I'm, I'm nervous. I mean, I, I don't want to see a blowout, but uh, I, I, I just think it might start getting away from him. But you know what's interesting, uh, Levy, is that there are moments when both players pause, right? Naturally. Anytime you play a blitz game, different players will think at different times. I think Sam thinking the opening and then seeing Ali Reza pause for what's been, what, 25, 30 seconds right now, mm -hmm. this moment of pause is more concerning to me than Sam spending time in the opening. And maybe it's because I'm a bit slower in the early stages of my Blitz games, but when you think in the opening, it's probably just figuring out what line do I want to go down. Here it's like, oh boy, I don't know what to do. What's the right continuation? I see my opponent's knight is going straight for the d5 square. I might have problems on a6. So he takes the pawn on f5 and says, give me that second pawn. But in return, look at Black's king, stuck here in the center, not doing too much. So interesting to see. I think it sets us up perfectly to remind everybody about the daily question today because that daily question is really revolving around, well, who is the most fun to watch? Which of these JSCC players? And um, I hope everyone gets involved with the hashtag speed chess. But I've liked everything I've seen so far today. Queen F3, yikes, hitting A8, hitting F6. Mm -hmm. Levy, is it, we're about to see an even match? Actually, I'm having a very difficult time refuting the move queen d8 from black. I mean, you attack both things, so why don't I just defend both of them? Okay, you're just, uh, you're saying, you don't believe. You're not a believer right now. No, I mean, I, I, look, like, again, Ali Reza is really, really thinking. So he just, yeah, oh. this, this is such an Ali Reza move. <laughs> but doesn't queen d8 defend both? I mean, it's such a difficult move to play. It's so ugly. 
But okay, queen side, yeah, that's the move I would play. I would never in my life play queen d8. It's just that, you know, when you're trying to play that, my coach does this. We, we study a position. I suggest the move. He goes, what kind of a move is that? And then yeah. he makes me kind of like walk him through the thought process, uh, even if it's the right move. It's the same thing here. I would never in my life play queen d8, but, you know, when I'm here trying to disprove what white has going on, I'm like, oh, what about queen d8? So yeah. queen d8 actually looks like a really good move the more I think about it. And right now, I mean, I prefer white's position because of just the king safety, right? White's king is very safe here. Black's king sitting on c8, it's getting safer as that rook swings over the queen side, but many of black's pawns are also falling in the process. I can go ahead and aim at this h4 pawn. Don't take it yet because if I take on h4, my e3 knight is hanging, but maybe I play a move like rook d3 or rook f3 or knight g4 just to get the knight out of the way. But black is in time to play bishop e7, but that's bishop e7, then queen g6, going after your e pawn. So it's, um, in my eyes, the 40 second lead on the clock, the better king safety. I think that seven is in good shape here. I'm um, like totally in the opposite boat. <laughs> you really think that you, you like uh, Fruge's position? Knight takes e5? Yeah, doesn't just... work quite yet, or does it? No, no, no. Knight e5, there is, uh... oh. Queen c2, I guess, was was available first. Yeah, but now, like, black will start the pawns rolling. I mean, e4, d5, bishop d7, bishop takes b2, bishop c3. Uh, this is a, this is an Ali Reza style. Knight, too. Knight, knight, knight doesn't work. I just hung a piece. Never mind. I'm so excited, you know, trying to argue with you. That <laughs> I'm like, let me just go for everything I want to do and not take yeah. any I just, I just believe in the kid. I mean, I don't know. Like, he, again, the time, the time doesn't matter. Ali Reza could have 45 seconds or a minute and a half. At the end of the day, he plays intuitively. He's got so much of this online experience in the field. The match situation does affect the nerves. That's kind of an odd move, though. I, yeah, I guess I I'm trying to prevent knight e5 ideas. But. What about knight f6 here? Okay, it just takes on... There we go, e4, boom. Now Sevian's got a minute to figure out his defense. Knight f6, easy move. E3! Oh, oh okay. Rook e2, just, just scoot that over. Oh, yeah, so you scoot the rook over. Yeah, but now knight e4 hits d6 and... Just push it, d5. <laughs> ah, stop it, man. I was going to go knight g5, but you're probably right. No, he's just playing on his initiative. I mean, it, it, it seems really... And look at the time the advantage is gone. Oh, man, I think this could get really bad in 3-1. I, again, I, I don't want to be like the, the NBA talking heads that you know flip a favorite in a series every game, but... Ali Reza is just so look at the bishop e5 geometric move. So Shuts out the knight. Queen e1 or something. Uh, I, I want to get your e3 pawn, but it's hard to get there. I need my rook protecting c2 at all times. So queen g4. Okay, going after e6. Rook f2. Just come. Rook f2. Let's go. Rook f2. You give me your e6 pawn. Probably oh. smart. Okay, d5. Fine. Okay, queen g5 now. Hits e5 and e3. Okay, he just moves the knight back. Hard to predict these moves right now. I feel like we're struggling, but maybe because the players are struggling. It's a very tense position. It is tense. Black has a huge initiative, but if white is able to kind of blockade along the light squares and then start pushing his own pawns, well, Rook of Z, what if I just... I kind of yeah. don't want to take... Oh, whoa, something feels off about that move. <laughs> Queen C2 came to mind, but it doesn't quite work. Yeah, Queen C2 is very tempting, but okay... Queen takes g2 here. Oh, e6 is hanging. So I can't just get away with that. So we're going to have d3. Oh, now, now he goes for it. All right. So oh, what's going on here? Queen g4 to protect the rook on e2. But then rook takes... No, rook c2 doesn't work. I'm very confused at what's going on here. Rook f4. Well, queen c6. Queen, rook, queen, oh, queen d4. There's rook e2 and queen, queen h1 mate. Queen takes b4 is check. He had queen takes b4 with check. He missed that opportunity. Oh, no, he lost his right side. No! Oh! Robert, in the final position, there's queen e4 and queen takes e3. Yes, there was queen e4 takes e... Exactly. But, oh, he didn't have any time to figure it out. Instead, we go on to the next game. Whoa. Wow. Well, I mean, now that the the, the the biggest lead of the match is here, it is six to four. Oh, let's just welcome everybody, huh? If, if you're just joining us, we're covering the Junior Speech Chess Championship, which is a... Uh, a knockout system tournament started with 16 players here on chess.com. We're down to eight. This is the quarterfinal, the first of three in the next three days. Yep. 
And uh, big money's at stake. Also, a spot in the Isle of Man Grand Swiss, which is. You're, you're going to laugh and sorry to cut you off there. This is, I believe, Aronian Sutasi 2007, not E4. E4 is a, uh, a different move. But I, I think the general gist of this opening is from an old school Aronian game. All right, look, Robert, like, I get it. <laughs> I get it. Like, you know games, man. But give the chat a chance. I know those games too. <laughs> maybe maybe you just pulled that one like out of your hat like you just knew that yeah because i remember at some point a game if we go back like four moves or whatever like this position and like night five to c3 i was like what is this like where did this come from and it's some just like old Aronian game that he played against sutowski from back in the day i started doing that recently but you know only games like in the past five ten years um <laughs> sorry going back 12 years is too far for you but you were saying isla man the winner of the jcc qualifies yes. for the speed chess championship and gets a spot in the isla man super swiss sorry yeah, it's, no it's 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 really really great and by the way for the next year junior speed chess championship there was the chess kid games which were won uh by hans neiman and his teammates so hans neiman is a uh, up and well i, I I, I always say up and coming just because he, he's still he's still going up and up. I mean, he's still going for the Grandmaster title, but he's one of the most talented juniors in the United States. Also streaming on chess.com. He's going to be playing in the U.S. Junior Closed Championship, which I believe starts in like a week or two in St. Louis. Uh, there's going to be commentary, and uh, he'll, you know, he'll, he'll look to add another tick to his resume. So It starts in a week or two. If by that you mean in two days. Yeah, that's when it starts, man. Oh, <laughs> I apologize. I, well, okay. I didn't know. Is the U.S. Senior Championship happening at the same time as that? Yes, it's the U.S. Oh. Junior, U.S. Junior Girls, and U.S. Senior Championship all happening at once. I will be doing the commentary. So I didn't. I apologize. Good. I don't. I don't mean to insult your your work. I. Uh, I'm, I'm really sorry. I feel zero percent <laughs> insulted. But I just let you know that I knew the dates because I'm doing the commentary. I thought that I, I didn't realize that they would do all three at the same time. I thought the juniors would go and then the seat, but they're everyone, everyone's playing. Dude, that's exciting. Uh, Larry Christensen is like at the top of that field. I think the most prestigious name in the senior field is Jan Elvis, right? I mean, he was fifth in the world at some point. So, uh, is John playing? I don't see, should look more closely at who's playing. <laughs> okay. Uh, I think, that. <laughs> no, I think he I think he is playing. I think remember, John, John who? You know, Jan Elvis, he is oh, playing. Oh, oh. Yeah, I thought you were talking about John Fedorowicz, who, by the way, had an amazing World Open. He did. I was very impressed. Joel Benjamin, Larry Christensen, Kedanov. Lots of uh, the old guard coming in for the U.S. Senior Championship. Yeah, I was really enjoying his games. Uh, no, saw all those guys in the top 10, 15 in the world. I got to say, I look at chess in the 90s, 80s, 70s, and I'm, I'm thinking, like, man... Ali Reza would be like a top five guy. Like that, you know, you look, you look at the at the FIDE rating comparison, right? It's just yeah. to show you how rating, I, I want to stay away from the word inflated, but how everyone's rating is higher. All this, you know, uh, what, is the, what is that phrase about the rising level of the sea and the ships, raises all ships, something like that. So, um, well, we are uh, taking a look at the player cards. We see... Uh, some of the ratings and interest by Sam Sevion thinks that aggressiveness is his strength. He's got to get some more positions where he's attacking Ali Reza rather than battling him in complex positions and trying to dip. Whoa, man. All it's right, we're going to an end game down upon. It looks like Sevion will have to defend because Bishop of six is saying, take me on B7. I'll take you on D8. You'll take me back. I'll take on E4. Dan White goes up a pawn, but Black has very good drawing chances. Uh, but we'll have to prove it. And down six seconds with under a minute on the clock is going to be very difficult. Ali Reza's got a new mouse, everybody, if you're not familiar. So there was a bit of a concern that maybe he wouldn't be 100% today. But it's not quite like catching a cold. You know, it's, it's just a device where you drag, drag a little icon that Let's you move pieces to turn the squares. I think he's going to be all right. He does seem all right so far. Up 1-0 in the 3-1 section. Maybe we can pull up the prediction, actually, of the match. We did see that, according to the metrics, it was supposed to be 5-4 in the 5-1, and it was. Curious to see what that 3-1 margin is supposed to be. 5.5, 4.5. Okay. 
Okay. I think that's a bold 1-1 one, one estimate, Robert. Do you really think it's going to be 5.5, 4.5, and 1-1? One, one? No. I think it's going to be more like 6.5, 3.5. That's, that's much larger, but it's really only one game. <laughs> right. One game. It seems so much larger. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I... He, he's proven that he's he's a competent defender and he's he's very very good at uh, at holding positions where he might be slightly worse. But well, this G five move actually is this end game just losing for for Black? No, I think it's still in that somewhat close to drawish territory because you put the rook behind the A pawn and it's moving your king back and forth. The problem for White is you want to push your pawn to A six and keep an attack on the F seven pawn. But you can't then push your pawn from a6. So I kind of stop it in its tracks. At some moment, I guess Black consider playing for f5 and hoping that his activity will help him make a draw. But I wouldn't play f5 myself. It just seems very risky. You can play h5. There it is. And the point is, if you take me on h5, I take with my king. And you take on f7. Yes, you have a two on one on the king side. Ooh. Oh, no. Oh, no. But is it so bad? Or is it just lost? No, he's still... He's still holding on here, but that was very, very risky and needlessly so. Yeah, this this h5 got kind of runs you into the problem of the check, forces the f1 forward, and back down we go with the checkmate threat. Now black can't move. But we are repeating a little bit, but... Because white can't really move either. How will white make progress? Okay, this isn't the third time this position has happened. No. Oh, the rook has been moving from c7 to e7. Yes. I was like, wait a second. This seems like they've been doing the same exact thing. I guess there's just no way to win, yeah. Maybe he had to not push the pawn to a6. Yeah, that might have been ill-advised. Rook h8 is now a move for black, by the way. Because by putting your rook on h8, <laughs> if you play rook g7 check, and I, oh, okay, that king's getting closer now. I keep checking, put the rook back, go after the f-pawn. Because if you win the F and G pawn, then you can just sacrifice your rook for the A pawn. And Wow. Well, what's happening here? He took. But... Check. Yeah, keep checking. I'm very yeah. confused. Yeah, I, I don't quite get this. Rook A8. Now your rook's free. Use it. No! Oh! Rook G1. There it is. No, rook B8, I check and take on A7. Oh! Oh my gosh! I didn't even see the time situation. He returns the favor by losing on time, and Ali Reza is fuming. That, oh my gosh, that is just unbelievable. That, that is the least likely result that I would have expected. Honestly, I didn't even look at the clock because I trust Ali Reza in bullet chest to not lose on time. That, He's so mad. Wow. I, that, that, that could go a long way. Wow, wow, wow. Unbelievable. He's so mad, and it might be the mouse. It yeah. might be the mouse. That's, that, that's pretty unbelievable. Wow. Ali Reza actually did confirm it was the mouse. It was the mouse. That's, that's, that's pretty amazing. Uh, I, hey, hold, holding, holding him back a little bit. I mean, he's got to... What is the proper amount of games that you play on a mouse before you're comfortable with it? That's a great question. I'm not sure. <laughs> I, I, I'm never comfortable on a mouse. All so. right, chat bros. You guys are psychologists. You guys are doctors. You guys are financial analysts. Uh, let us know the answer to this question. You guys have a lot of. You guys you, you wear a lot of. Wear a lot, a lot of hats. Let, let us know how many games it takes. Can you let me know, Levy, what uh, seven tends to do with this pawn on e5? I've got no clue. You can't play bishop at four. Maybe you go f6. Can you play f6? Play f6 here? But f6 just seeds control over all the light squares, and I mean, I'll just take it, right? Like f6, takes, takes, and maybe eventually I can go rook e6 and gather this pawn, but you might have to. g4, look at him just sacrificing the pawn for quick play in the center. So I'll go rook d1, I guess. This reminds you of the first game, Levy, where the bishop's on h4, but in the first game, the bishop was on a4, right. stopping a rook from the central square. Yeah, the bishop on h4 does control the diagonal, but it seems like it's not going to have any part in the game. I mean, the, the critical fight is going to happen on the d-file and on the queen side. 
Right. Uh, unless black finds a way to to, to to do something on the king side or white. Right? Um, so G six is a possibility. Mm -hmm. There he does it. And the thing is, white can put the knight on pre with like knight e four, but it's not good enough because after knight e four, black will take on e four. You take my bishop on d seven, but your bishop on f four is hanging. So two pieces for black, only one for white. Yeah, but at the end of the day, this structure is just really good for black. Uh, this this Berlin structure is, is it's called a wall for a reason. And to add the fact that you're just up a pawn, it's it's uh I, I mean I don't know, G6 just looks very logical. Break apart the king side, king goes to B7. Spindle won a very, very nice game against Nightish in that tournament that I covered. Uh, at Drenke, and he basically just had this, except that Nidish was not down a pawn. Nidish had a pawn. I so like that move, though. Yes, exactly. So Bishop, Bishop h6, though. Look at that, going to f8. That's a sneaky threat. Yeah. I mean, it's super obvious, so it's not that sneaky, right? Like, why did you put your Bishop on h6? Oh, because Bishop f8. Is he going to have rookie one check after that? I guess so. So there, you know, so much for that attack. Who, who was that grandmaster everybody talked about uh, in the Soviet Union that liked to fake that he fell into his opponent's traps? Was it Mikhail Tal? Or was it was it Botvinnik? But basically, that's what I was told. It was like, they, they wanted to make their opponents feel like they got him, and then no, they didn't actually get him. And he found a way out. He would, you know, get the loot and run. I see someone in the chat says Geller. But I have no idea if that's true. I mean, they're saying different names. I I have no idea. I know this, you know, the general story, but I don't know who it actually was. And, okay, Sabian oh, Geller. See, so, sometimes chat says something so confidently that you know you just gotta go. Oh wow, I mean, they know something I don't. Yeah, it's only true like eight percent of the time. <laughs> um, am I being snide, Robert? Is that a, is that a good word to describe me? Snide. Yeah, it's a great word. It's a really good word. I think it works for you. I like it. I'm gonna take it. How about, how about a name? I, I can see like a, a kid being named that. Yeah, it kind of somewhere between snarky and snide. Snarky and snide. So what's happening in this game? Ferruja is up nearly a minute. He plays f4, freeing this bishop on d7. Probably the f5 square is the landing uh, point, and White simply down two pawns. This game is gone after a win on the clock. For Sevian, everything has gone wrong in this game. Yep. Everything. Absolutely. Well, there's just nothing to do. Now White has stranded his own bishop on h6 completely out of the game, and there's not much to it. Yep. L look, uh, this match is 6-5, but two games... One where there was a mate in one, and now another one where Ali Reza flags. It's 8-3. Could be the scoreline. Although uh, Sevian did flag in kind of, they, they kind of switched uh, flagging, right? Because Sevian, at that point in that game, he was kind of taking over against Frugia. Yes, yes. I guess it's a little, it's just, it's a little bit different because like Sevian was suffering, it felt like most of that game. Yeah. And so Ali Reza just threw everything at the guy and was like, all right, if you flag, you flag. And then Sevian couldn't quite keep his nerves there, uh, but of course, yes, they do. They do swap back and forth a point here and there. It's easy to play the what if game. Uh, I've just been a bit more convinced, I would say, by Ferruja. I agree. Now Bishop E1 is lights out for the record. H3 Bishop takes H3 check actually was even better, but he wins. Mm -hmm. Too bad. So right. seven, five. And now we switch to d4 by Ferruja. What do you think that's all about, Levy? I mean, I think he's just flexing that he knows a lot. Uh, he's going to see what, what, what Sam has for him here. Uh, Sam, Sam played c5, which was kind of interesting to me. Uh, I think he's more of a, was a Nimso Indian player, just plays his b6, b6 kind of stuff. Um, but, okay, just going to lead to another. Well, I mean, White can play e4 now. Okay, e4, and, you know, we have a Sicilian-like position, right? Yep. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I'm I'm really scared. Uh, I'm like I said, I, I've been scared for Sevian throughout the three one. I know it's it's level, but I think at any moment Ali Reza can 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 fly away with it. 
So if Sevian can continue to, to hold one or two games within and maybe strike at a certain moment, that's, that's how he's got to win this match. Yeah, for sure. I mean, he's two games down, but you know, a single win gets him. He cuts the deficit in half, of course. So right now we see that Sevian with the black pieces is tr transposed into a Sicilian structure. He didn't, didn't intend for that to happen, but here it is. And he's up on the clock. So Ferruja, despite being the one who deviated from their typical games and has played D4 in the first move, he's the one who's ending up spending a lot of time. He's trying to go nine knight to B5, put a piece on D6, and that's why Black plays D6 first. Then you can go knight B5 all you want, and then I can put something on E5, my pawn or my knight there, to block your bishop on F4. So A6, makes sense. And knight E5, this is all thematic, all of it. Yep. I, I like these positions for black, honestly. I, I think that the, the dynamics appeal to me strongly. Uh, ideas along the C file, some moment maybe F5 in the future. G5, look at this. I, I, I love it. I love it. Uh, not a move out of tilt either. It's a, it's a logical move. Wow. I really want to know if Karpov is watching this First, because, well, Karpov is a legend, and it'd be awesome if he's watching us commentate some games, but also because Karpov had some great battles in these Marazzi bind type structures, and you see this very typical plan for Black to go G5 to stop F4, and if Black White ever was G3, to try to get F4, look at his bishop on B7 to have a new lease on the game, because as soon as you go G3, you weaken the F3 square and allow Black to play G4 ideas. So F5 is something that Black could consider, you have to be very timely before you make a move like f5 and instead h5, perfect move, try to go h4 if you want. But I like how Sevian is not rushing this. He's just playing move by move, figuring out, does he want to play for g4? Does he want to play for h4? Does he want to put his knight on f4? Maybe his king should go to h7 so he can go rook to g8. Does he want to play f5? All these different ideas come to mind for white and, sorry, for black, and white is actually doing his ideas, right? Knight to b3 makes sense. Is c5 coming in the near future? Is a4 going to be played? Is b5 an option? Which pawn do I push and when? Is, it, is f5 ever possible for black? Because it's like, what does black want? He's got all his pieces out, but now what? f5 I mean, definitely is an option. But, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a very committal move, and you allow white to secure a knight on d5, right? So, uh, whoa. 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 I like it. Fireworks. July 4th might have passed, but this game is going to be full of fireworks. And take Listen, on F3. There's anything about living in New York is that fireworks go off the entire week of July 4th. Yep. So. Very true. <laughs> Wait, I like that five actually. Maybe even now. F5, Bishop B8, FE4. Oh my gosh. What is C takes D6? Is he just going to take on E4 and just sacrifice? He will, won't he? Like, if, you, if we pull up the analysis board real quick, oh, we don't even need the analysis board because we're seeing it happen right on screen here. Wow. Take C3, knight takes F3 tactics as well. So if you go queen E3 here, rook C3, rook C3, knight F3, and if you take on F3, bishop takes E4, but I have to worry about the D-pawn pushing. Who's better? Why? I don't know. Take E4. Take, whoa, 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 whoa. Take F3. Oh, but oh. take F3 is D7. Oh, knight F3, D7 is disgusting. That, 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 that means that it's a good move. It's not like a... Just in case anyone's confused. Yeah. Maybe just FE4. Oh, this is just such an insane position. Right, this but, is... but FE4, your D7 comes, right? There's like options like that. So D7? I thought I'd just stick with the knight. Okay. Again, I have no idea what's going on. I'm going to be straight up with you. Yeah. I, really I mean, I can trade the queens on D7. Is that a... Oh, is Rook F7 like a possibility here? Just casually stopping D7? Yeah, or, or Queen F7. Rook F7 or Queen F7, both. Okay, it goes Rook F7. I have no idea what's happening here. Bishop takes A6. Knight C6 is also possible, but probably just Knight F3. I'm also good. Knight F3 to D7. Now it's it. Take E4. Take a Chat, another thing to mention. If you're watching the game and you have an engine on, don't look at it. It's so easy to sit here and go, all you know, these guys are blundering away opportunities, but with 40 seconds on the clock, you cannot possibly work your way through this position. Let the game go on, let it develop, enjoy the fireworks. Uh, don't try to sit there being the know-it-all. That's, that's the hardest thing about this because 
Nowadays, we have the answers. We can say, what? That move is plus four. What a terrible move. Right. But no one, no one kind of gets why. And so let's just enjoy this. Sam Savion is up a queen, but there's a pawn on d6, Robert. <laughs> yeah, knight c5 is a really useful move because rook takes c3 was certainly in the cards. If you could take on c3 and then take on e4 with check and open up this king, queen f2 is a scary move to see. You can't go rook c2. You can't go rook d2. So it's just one check away. Like a knight f3, queen takes h2, or knight f3, queen g1 mate. But you need to get there first. Knight e6 is possibly over, but then d7 is hanging. Um, can I actually mail up to my knight f3? Knight e, oh my gosh, that would have been winning. So he played bishop e2 out of necessity to well, get d1. Well, I, yeah, I was thinking king h7 or g, but knight f3 is crushing because after bishop f3, queen f3, um, h3, he, h3 and king h7 or rook, g. Rook g1 here, just sacrifice, yep, sacrificing material is the way to go. But I don't know if it's quite enough because the d7 pawn still will need some defense. And 26 seconds to 15 seconds. Oh, queen oh, e1. He picked up the knight. Now it's over. Now it's very clear. He missed queen e1 in that clip on YouTube, uh, on, on, on Twitter. Queen d1. But this time he finds queen e1. All right, just keep giving checks. I mean, you got to play queen d2. Come on. Queen yep. d2, please. Queen d2. What's he thinking about? What else queen. can you do? Queen, queen f6? But well, that looks a bit strange. Queen e3. To take on e4. Yeah. Bishop takes e4. It was a free pawn with check. He's going to do it now. There it is. And then bishop f5. And that makes life easy. Wow. wow. Okay. I'm I'm nervous for Sevion, but I am giving him all the credit in the world. It's a seven six match. This it's, is awesome. Yeah, this is great. Okay, here we go. Berlin, main line once again. So hopefully for Sevian, he doesn't blunder a pawn like he did last game. That was pretty careless. He essentially went F5 and just blundered the E pawn. So that that was not advisable. Bishop D2, this is. Levon Aronian versus um, Sergei Karyakin from the recently concluded Grand Chess Tour, if I'm not mistaken. Um, at least you're, probably, you're probably not mistaken. Don't, don't, don't even say that nonsense. Now, the last time this game happened, Robert, uh, yeah. I think it was, it was Sevion who struggled mightily, right? I mean, he, he lost the pawn and then he just... Look, he won that game. That was the game that Ali Russell <laughs> flagged. That was, but. Yeah. He had a no, 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 no. He, no. Ali Reza won that game. He went like he, uh, Sevian resigned in that one. Are you sure? Yeah, there's like rookie three at the end with h3 hanging on bishop e1 and then seven resigned. Okay, okay, I'm not convinced, but I, I think you're right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm losing track of them, don't worry. Yeah, but because because I there, there was a very, very bad position where white just lost this this f1, put the bishop on h4. Yes, you're right, he did resign that game. That game was that game was uh, very quick work. Absolutely right. Um, and but, we're in similar territory to Aronian Karyakin. Uh, I think I now I'm already lost track of that game. But a five, I don't remember being played. At least not this early. It looks very nice for White at first glance. I mean, you can play g four if you'd like, just to continue pressing forward. Put your bishop on g three after you play g four. G four is not entirely necessary, but ever, whenever Rook moves away from the h file. Move like g4 feels uh, quite decent. So, so I was looking at bishop c3, but I also was thinking of c4, like c4, c5, bishop c3. Uh, I, again, I don't have any experience on either side of Berlin, um, but e6 might be played. The yeah. more space you can take, the better, right? I mean, that's how it feels. And e6, then f6. There's some lines where you just give up your e pawn just crash through with your pieces and a3 is probably the most prudent move just saying well what are you doing here you want to go a3 perhaps e6 now is still tempting and if i can get the analysis board real quick um if you get e6 well, f6 and f6 and g5 here just looks crushing sorry i don't mean to get you off oh you might be right too but their idea is with you just go like this and get opposite color bishops and just win all the kingside pawns but if we get to the game f6 was played you're yeah levy you, you got a good point here knight g5 Going after F7. Oh, C5 is hanging now as a free pawn. Oh, he just gave him C5. What's, what's that? He might not have seen, He might do your knight G5 move anyway, right? Knight G5, the point is after bishop E6, you have rookie one and just try to take that. But he's going <laughs> around. <to> <laughs> yeah, this, this, is, this is terrible. I mean, he, he, wow, Sevian's about to even up this. I don't want to jinx anybody. <laughs> and thank I you, Peter Tija31, saying good stream, Hessen Levy. Appreciate that. And a car is in the chat. 
Yes, yeah, so Devion's done very, very well. He's he's managed his emotions. Well, I don't even know if he's really experiencing all that many emotions. I mean, I, I, I'm not sure his anything has happened on his face more than a quivering of a lip every now and then. He is <laughs> he is like rock solid. Alirez has been singing. Hikaru, I don't know if you were here earlier, but I'm fairly certain Alirez was trying to pull off a, a bit of a Hikaru impression with uh, singing and head bobbing. Uh, Hikaru very famous for that when when he's playing these matches. This is yeah. looking very very nice. But it's also one of these positions where if you don't land a knockout blow, it's, you can be in danger of allowing Faruja back into the game. And not only back into the game, right? Helping him avoid a tilt. Faruja lost the previous game. And if now Seve going to second straight game, we've seen in Faruja's answers to pre-match interview questions, his biggest weakness, he feels, is his frustration. And Faruja is somebody who can go on tilt. Oh, and- wow. Speaking of which, he's just horrible ones. Look at Florida signs. Yep, there it is. That's a free uh, free piece because it's pinned to the rook. And Faruja is not happy. And I see it in chat, Hikaru. He's got to tilt Ali Reza to win. If Ali Reza stays focused, he's still going to win. So we're all on the same page here. And we see that Sevian ties the score up. 25 minutes left in this three-minute segment. We're back to this sort of Steinitz deferred situation, which I have played growing up. Um, I know that it wasn't always applauded by some of my contemporaries. I thought that it was not a great opening for Black, but Sevian's been using it in multiple games in this match, and I think he has performed quite well with it. Yeah, his th- this G6, D6 approach from him and the Rulopas in this match has been really successful. I mean, obviously, it, it, it really does remind you of, of like a boxing match when you don't have a lot of time like you do in a traditional sporting environment, right? Like if you... If you play basketball, soccer, you can call time out. You can talk for five minutes to your team. You don't really get that in these in these formats. You have like barely seconds to regroup, and then after ninety minutes, you have a quick water break, rest, whatever. You can't plug a hole in your repertoire in the middle of a match. <laughs> like yeah. if if Sevian's having success, he's gonna go to this every time E four happens. That's it. So and, and you're absolutely right. Importantly, he's playing quickly as well, right? Like you can't necessarily plug a hole and. He, what you can do is play more quickly, and sometimes that is the best plug you can have, right? Yeah, I mean, speed, well, speed obviously very, very important. I'm curious what will happen in uh, in the one one segment if he's just going to continue to play Ru Lopez. Uh, it's amazing you can play a brilliant uh, an opening such as that one when it's uh, a minute on the clock. But yeah, the Ru Lopez is it doesn't discriminate on, on the time control. So, very true. Knight yeah, H4 it, is tempting at any point just to go after the G6 pawn with a pin on the F7 pawn, but King H7 is the natural response anyway. And, well, okay, if the King H7 was going to be the move played, no real need to put your Knight H4. I don't know, Levy. There he is in the chat, by the way. Shout out to Danny Wrench. Chad's been begging to see you. There he is. Hope you're having a wonderful day in... Uh, uh, I don't know where Danny is. How's, is your Danny tracker on, Robert? What day is it? It's uh, Tuesday, which is, let's see, what is Danny up to right now? He is in the office, probably not too far away from <laughs> Aaron. He's happy celebrating a weekend with his family. <laughs> Currently battling Larry the Lizard. Nice. I love it. I don't know what that is. I'm going to just go, I'm going to just smile and wave. <laughs> Good uh, idea. Good idea. You don't want to know. Oh, oh, watch out for the queen side now. C4 is coming in full force for Ali Reza and C7. We've seen this a consistent problem for Sevian in this match is this pawn on C7. Multiple games, he's been stuck with um, a top position over there on the queen side. But if he can get C6 in and then eventually get D5 in, he's going to break free all of his pieces, including that bishop on G7. This might be the most successful E4, E5 for White that we've seen Faruja get. So, oof. This is very nice play pressure. Sorry, go ahead. No, you're absolutely right. So I'm always wondering if there's some kind of knight E takes D5 tactic where I get E4 in at the end. But mm. with your knight on G3, it's not possible. So I would like to kick your knight from G3 such that knight E takes D5 and then E4 is some tactic on the, it's also on the long diagonal. It's like a relatively old idea in the King's Indian, right? Like when you have a king on G8 rook F8, you can sack on e4 and play f5, and white's pieces are all kind of fighting the pawns, yep. which is not what you want. Yeah, it's a very interesting idea. That's not a Sevian level idea, though. 
Uh, Sevian has proven time and time again in this match. He's a very solid guy. He's had a lot of opportunities to sacrifice a piece. I'm not sure he's done it a single time. Uh, I can't remember it. I mean, remember he had like Bishop takes H3, all these ideas, but he's just, he plays solidly. He slowly improves his position. Yep. And he put his king on h8 to avoid any sort of pins on the light squares. Knight b6 played his response to bishop a4. You'd like to go bishop c6, but all it is bishop takes c6. Do not take with your knight and get your bishop trapped on d7. Yeah, don't do that. Take bishop on c6. And then does black get d5 in? That's my question right now. Can I go d5? It's He plays rook b8 first. I guess under d5, he anticipated bishop takes b6. But d5 is what black would like to do either next move or in the near future. Yep. Yeah, bishop b6. Now you've got rook b6. It's going to hit c6. It's very, very good. Time, though. 30-second advantage for... Or 20 seconds now for Ali Reza. So that's always good news if you're a Faruja fan. And rook c2 plays. So is d5 still not possible? I guess not. It's just queen e8. Is D5 yes. now possible? <laughs> I'm going to ask it every move. Yeah. I mean, Black's got to search for counterplay. That's the way you got to play this position. I mean, there's... My bishop on G7 is really bothering me. Okay, A5. A4 makes sense. That way he can put his rook on A5 at the right moment to start, you know, eyeing his B5 pawn. Rook A5 looks seconds. pretty good. Thirty seconds. Ooh, h5 is typically not a move I would like to play because I give the g5 square to white's knight. Yeah. And after knight g5, he might be looking to sack on h5. He's pulling the Ali Reza here. Yeah, he's getting very passive here. Does, doesn't seem very much in his style to fight back with aggressive counterplay, which is very much Ali Reza's style. I mean, they're yeah. very different from each other, it feels. Yeah, he's trying to close the position a bit. Um, but so he can go knight g4 and go after this bishop on e3. In fact, you can take that bishop on e3, but Alarez is claiming, I don't care, take that bishop. My knight is going to d5. Rook a5 is a is, wow, knight h7. Yeah, that hey, is this, look good. this is one way to play, man. It's, it's, it's a way to go, but oh, this is this wow. Queen wow. f7, I guess you have to. Queen d8 was maybe better. Queen d8 allowed you to go knight e7 next, so he's getting active, but it's too little, too late. Knight f6. Okay, go for knight of six. Just do it. This is actually the type of play you need for a black to get in this game. You could have went g5, but I like the decision going to knight of six to remove that knight from the center. Go for your idea with rook a5 levy. The b5 pawn can be vulnerable. b6 is an idea for white here. Maybe b6 actually works. Yeah, this... Blasting open the queen side. In these kind of closed structures, there it is. There's got to be a tactic. Sevian doesn't know what to do. He's going to go knight d5 and b7. Knight e7. Just give up the rook. Yeah. I think Give it up there. Yeah, that's what you got to do. Why there? Why did one Okay, maybe just trying to close the B file. All right, E4. Oh, the knight takes E4. Darn. I want to go E4 to hit this rook on B2, but there was knight takes E4 protecting the rook anyway. Sevian just seems so restrained, Robert. I mean, he's, he's just, just, you're worse. You're like much worse. Just throw a punch. See what happens. Yep. See what happens if you lose, you lose. You were going to lose. But, but maybe he doesn't, you know, he doesn't have the same philosophy. His philosophy is totally different. Actually. And the game is still going. I mean, 90, there might be some 93 tactics at the right moment. Here oh. it is. So, uh, but you have to take with your rook and then rook d7. And okay, this is, this is not good news. That's me. That's, that's very nice. Rook g7, rook d8, game over. And there it is. Ferruja takes back the lead. I'm going to channel the stats team. I don't have the answer on hand. How many ties and lead changes have we had? I feel as though every time there's a tie, the next game goes to Ali Reza. I might be mistaken. But, wow, they are flying through. They are flying through this, this, this Rouser. I think that's true every game except for game one because they were tied 0-0 zero, zero, and 7 won the <laughs> first game. But otherwise, I think you're totally correct. And yes. here, I like, generally speaking... Sevian's chances in these structures. I know that you, you, know, you were all for Ali Reza the last time they had this, but I don't really believe in double pawns and blitz, if that makes sense. Probably doesn't make sense, but I don't. It makes perfect sense. I mean, it's a, it's a philosophy. Someone in chat just said that they don't agree with my philosophy on, on counterplay and defending. They, they like what Sevian is doing. They like to be solid. 
listen, uh, whoever, you know, that, that's the beautiful thing about chess. We all get to pick a style, right? So just like uh, on the Wii, we used to be able to customize our hair and, our, and all that other stuff. We can customize our openings. We can customize our styles. Everything is great. So D5, again, very much an Ali Reza type of move. He's got a structural weakness. He offsets that by playing dynamically. And in a lot of these rouser positions, who really has the weaker king? Right? I mean, because black is lined up directly down the down the queen side. So and the weaker pawns are definitely black, right? F6 is mm -hmm. a target. You play rook d6, which is why our queen d6, something like that, to pin your knight if you're ever taking f6, to be careful. A6 has been hanging, but also opens up the A file for black. So if you take on a6, black is very happy to start putting pieces over there. And queen a5 immediately will hit a2. But even if it wasn't that immediate, you could see how when pieces shift to the a file, having an open a file can help black deliver a mating attack. And right now, for Sevian, he is trying to figure out exactly what to do because g2 is hanging. He might want to play g4, but then bishop f3 comes in, and that could be an issue. So queen g7 doesn't attack f7, thanks to the bishop being on d5. Yeah, you need to figure out exactly how to progress here. Otherwise, you're letting black coordinate. Yeah, I mean, black, okay, well, what if I just play like A5? 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 Am yeah. I am overly optimistic? I guess I'll double with rook E to D1. Just trying to... And then you A4. Yep, there it comes. There. Yeah, I don't know, A5, A4. This, this is my style. I'll see what happens. That's why I'm not 2600 or participating in the event, potentially. But, um, I mean, you can't play knight f6. That's the thing. You invested all these moves into playing knight f6, but you can't quite play it because you'd be pinning yourself. So, right. yeah, everything that White's done is a bit too slow. And then there's the counter attack. So, the knight in tribe is just kind of stuck. Right, you can mm -hmm. play knight g3 to bring it back towards the center, and you probably should do that. But even once it gets there, it's not clear how to make progress because a4, a3 is an option for black trying to go for a mating attack. Yeah, this is looking quite nice now. a5, a4, all right, g4, I, where's he going? He's gonna go g5 next, and then once you take, he's gonna go f6. I don't think it works, but that's what I'm gonna be trying to do. That is... Or knight takes f6, so that when you pin me, I have g5 protecting the knight f6. g4 is so committal. It is, wow. And like a4, a3 is still tempting, and I'll just go queen d4 and try to mate you on uh, b2. So like, something like that looks pretty good. Rook d6 is solid, wow. So from 7-7, from seven, seven, we might see 9-7. What about queen g7 here? Like, can I go after h pawn? Is that what well, queen g7? Okay, he didn't now, do it. Now he, now he plays on g3. But I thought queen g7 was actually interesting. And the reason why queen g7 I like was I can go g5 next and then go after the pawn e5 with my queen. But maybe that was just also wishful thinking. No, I mean, yeah. Like the car is saying in the chat, you got to fight. That's, that's what he... That's sort of what's been missing in some of these games. And he, he's very solid in his defense, but... Okay. Too solid. Yeah, almost too solid. I mean, having said that, you know, you could throw a punch and you could do it poorly, you could lose. So, can you take and play like bishop f8, bishop h6? Yep, you definitely can. He's probably worried about, you know, in these end games with his f pawn, but I agree with you, Levy. That looked pretty good. Played, at some point, he's got to play g5, right? He's got 10 seconds. Yeah, what's he doing? 94? Is that his intention? What about b3 here? For black. Yeah. Hey, man. Probably taken bishop e4. No, but then, yeah, bishop e4. Oh, bishop e4 was nice, I think. The thing is, like, I don't even think it's that bad necessarily, but you've got eight seconds. Right. I mean, I don't see what... why I like keeping more pieces on the board. Because if you take on e4, it gives white the obvious out with queen takes e4. Now, if you go b3, I do take on e4. I guess if you take on e4, bishop e4 covers the c3 score. And watch out for white playing c4. If white gets something like c4 in, I think. Yeah, Robert, A3, I think you should have played C4. And, oh, my gosh. 
I mean, it would have been crazy, but the rook covers B2. Like, he should have just done it immediately. That, I've been looking at that, but... Yeah, that's actually a good call. I mean, you just don't give yourself enough time to work this all out. He's, now he's just praying that Ali Reza gets low on the block. Yep. And if you go C4, Bishop C5 to D4 doesn't exactly look enticing to me. But maybe he'll go C3 because he wants to open up the C file, right? He, he definitely would like to open the C file. C3 or C4, big moment. Big, big moment. He's, there yep. is. Queen anywhere. Yep, Queen of three is good. Okay, he's fighting back really well. Rook D2, you're not getting to B2 with check yet. I can take on B4. So that would be a problem for black, right? Because the, the queen and bishop being on the same line as the rook is a problem. So rook C2. Now rook D2, still C takes B4. Although then there's rook B2 check. Yes. And then bishop D4. Oh, rook B2, bishop D4, you sack the queen, but you win. Wow, this is actually not looking so bad. I mean... He's saving what? himself. Yeah, this is, this is amazing. Bishop B4. Okay, and that queen g1 check's a big threat. Rook, rook c6, like that, rook c6 was winning. No, it was queen g1 check. I don't think you're... The king c2. Oh, but rook d2. Yeah. Rook c6, rook c1, oh, rook c8 maybe. Rook c8 came unexpectedly there. Queen c4 okay, check. There's got to be queen b7 check. Can't lose that. Okay, now, yeah, now... That, okay. Wait but, a second. This is still actually... These, some of these end games can be tricky for black because of the uh, past pawn potential. But it's, yeah, it's not one of them, I guess. Yeah, it's it's impossible to get in unless he goes, you know. He's going to C4, exactly. Oh, C4. oh. Give me that pawn. But how does he make progress from here? That's the question. Yeah, he, he, he can't. Uh, he can play B4 and sack the pawn, but yeah, nah. looks like this is wrong. Oh, but Ali Reza can play this on and on. How much time is left now? 10 minutes? No real point, I guess, but he will. <laughs> And Carson's big draw. Yep. Oh, don't don't let him in. Or maybe let him in. Bishop F7. Nope. It'd be funny if Ali Reza is actually trying to win this game. Why not? <laughs> Why not? It's a good question. All right, 10 minutes to go. Probably we have time for two at most, three more games. Uh, depending on how this one concludes. All right, so Sevion stays within striking distance, obviously being down two points in this format. Not very good. <laughs> not very good, but Sevion goes, by, okay, not D6, but he goes to this G6. Right away, going for um, these type of Sviddler lines. I feel D4, like Sviddler is... D4, D4, yeah, D4 is the critical way, right? This is how you... Is C3 a move here? Okay, just go through... Yeah, this is some... Some theory, I think. It's not theory that I know. I would not play this myself, but. <laughs> so what now? You probably have a variety of options. H4. <laughs> you see, Rec Fire goes Ali Reza eight and a half, Hess seven and a half. <laughs> yes. I, 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 I don't know, but that's okay. Robert, how does this setup make any sense for Black? So go F7, G6, H7. And trade oh. your archbishop. bishop. Pre-moving bishop b3 <laughs> comes back, might come back to haunt him. Because he could have, there, he's shaking his head, of course. He pre-moved bishop b3, just real quick. He could have taken. Oh, taken yes. He thought that seven would take back with a knight, seven takes back with a pawn, and then he pre-moved, and now he's going to get himself in trouble because c4 threatens to trap the bishop. Bishop b7 attacks the pawn e4. f5 helps out in the attack of the e4 pawn. So... Castle's queen side can be played with a nice check on the king. All right. So what now? B4, knight d5 happens, and that doesn't look so appealing. pre move for the loss, Hikaru said. So what's interesting is that uh, Sam, this system with g6 and actually bishop g5 and all this stuff, uh, he's actually had in over the board. He's had it a couple of times. Uh, he's won both those games, actually, both in 2016. Uh, another top-level game in 2016 that saw this line was the game Jean Caruana in the U.S. Championship. So, there we go. I'm pulling that up on my database. I'm not actually memorizing that. I had no idea these games happened. <clears throat> you called me out for knowing that? Ikaru said that you had this position over the board. Is that true? I have not had this position over the board. No way. Not this exact position. But it's possible. That's amazing if the car actually knew that. If he knows my games better than I know my games, I would not, uh, that would not be unexpected at all. But this looks 
pretty nice for Black, all things considered. Ali Raza having himself a stretch. It's been a long match. It's been a long one for us, too. But nearly 6,000 of you joining us. Shout out to all of you watching on the chess.com homepage. Twitch homepage. This is the Junior Speech Chess Championship. Any and all questions about what the heck this is all about. We've got an amazing mods team, support staff. Robert and I just trying to make the games more appealing and accessible to all of you. It's been a great match. We've been treated to some fun chess today. We absolutely have, and there will be a couple more fun matches coming up, right? As we see right there, tomorrow, Wei Yi versus Jordan Van Forest and Maxudlu, Parham versus Alexei Sorano. So two great matches ahead. Of course, this match is still everything to play for, and we'll see how this uh, goes from two, here. Two of the eight players in that final eight players are uh, are American, American-born grandmasters, but we might be seeing one of them go home in the next half an hour or so. So we'll see what happens. There are actually tactics at play here if we just pull up the analysis board real quickly, because instead of bishop c6, b takes c4 was an option, because if you get the c2 square for your knight, not only are you forking rooks, but after rook e8, rook e8, you need to move your rook, and knight e3 check comes and hits your bishop on c4. So maybe bishop f7 was the way out, uh, just like desperately seeking an attack on this knight on e3 to survive, but it looks very close there. It looks very close. It's, it does feel as though White has sort of figured it out a little bit, uh, even though he kind of ran into this pre-move debacle early. Um, but King a5. Huh. That king is awesome, by the way. Actually, can you can't stop me from going king before, can you? <laughs> uh... You got to be real careful. Did I just play a3? Well, king four was your idea? Well, that's gonna, if you're, when your bishop was on b3, I was going to play king b4. But now that your bishop moved, taking on c4 made perfect sense. And I think Sevens calculating, can I go into, what kind of end game can I go into? And he takes the bishop and puts the king on b4 anyway. But these are tripled, isolated pawns. And we were talking about ugly pawn islands earlier, Levy. You, you know, you mentioned that in one of the earlier games. This is as an atrocious looking pawn structure as you can get for black. Yeah, this is really, really bad. The, the only way you can offset this is to use the pawns almost like a, like a rock climbing wall, step at a time, kind of team up the pieces, uh, control certain squares, for example, like d5, but it's really difficult. Um, a5, a4, a3 is a possibility. Yep, and if white sure. ever plays a3, king b3, so. Rook d8 threatens rook b8 checkmate. Funnily enough, what? All like 92. Rook d6 now. This feels good. Rook c2. Then bishop a4. a4. And then my get rook gets the d2. And if you go king e1, as just played, I think I can just continue with a4 and keep that tension there with the rooks. Oh, a3, king b3, knight c1. Was mate. Ooh, okay. Yeah, this is fine. As long as you can get this, this is fine. And not like the boats as kind. You know, like that boat says meme. This is this is actually okay. And Robert, why am I why am I start playing rookie five, rookie seven, considering taking his own pawns? Yep, rookie six here, threatening the a four pawn. Okay, when rookie five. Oh my gosh. Oh my Turn gosh. this one around. Wow, what a comeback for Ali Reza here. Oh man, if he wins this game. Yeah, I mean, I, I want to say he had no business winning this game. Okay, Bishop I like that move. You can give him your a4 pawn. That pawn is probably less important than the h pawn, right? So putting your bishop on g6 makes sense, but you are going to lose your a4 pawn. That's not good at all. Let's go king b7. Why to a7? Interesting. Yeah, I'm not so sure, actually. Let's go bishop g6. No, this is bad. This is really, really bad. This is really, really bad. If Sam loses this game... He's going to have three minutes, it's just under three minutes on the clock, to play one more 3 1 game. If, personally, I think that if he does not get a decisive result, a victory in that game, then 1 1 might be hopeless. I mean, a three game margin, Sevian versus Ali Reza, might be in, like just impossible. Wait, but he might be holding now because rookie six check. How does your king, king can't go to the D5 without rook G6 winning G2. So he actually might be surviving this. Oh, rook g6. 
Uh, weird way to play for a win. Take on G2. You can take on C4. Take H2. How is this playing for a win? Uh oh. Uh oh. What? What was this? Okay, he's gonna go up a pawn. C5 is hanging. Oh shit! This is still, this is still possible. Ooh, the knight's trapped. Nice, nicely done. So just take it. Probably just take this knight and play two on one, same side, holding. Wow. King B6, King A6. Man, I think we just had so much excitement. Uh, I, I I don't think Chad is going crazy about this game. Robert, did, did you and I miss something? Yeah, I think they put somebody on air and we both missed it. Oh man, are you serious? That would have been fun. I mean, this end game is a draw. This is not super fun. This is, uh, all right. One minute to go. Actually, the players might might even expire the full time. Well, watch out for seeing a time. Look at both their clocks. Yeah, just seconds on the clock. I mean, okay. Perugia and Sevin both lose one game on time in this match. So hopefully this one is not a game with those time because it should be a draw. Playing just with King B5? Okay, whatever. 50 seconds, by the way. Again, oh. it's a similar... Oh, six, you just take is the A-pawn, right? Draw, right. Robert, 40 seconds. What, what was rook B1? What? He meant rook A1 check. I think he mouse slipped. Oh, oh no. Gosh. Not only that. Wait, now, now another moment. He can resign or he can play this out to the conclusion. Yeah, that's a great point. He's got 30 seconds. Does he go for another game? I mean, it, does Ali Reza, first of all, does Ali Reza even go for another game himself? Does he just milk the time? Oh, man, I don't know. I don't know. That's unbelievable. He should I resign. Think, I think he's got, he's got eight seconds. He's got almost no time. He's got to get another game in there. So Ali Reyes is purposely um, drawing this out. And looks like the time is up. It looks like the time is up. All right. It is the last game. Wow, Robert, that's, that's a bummer. That is a that that is going to be very very difficult for Sam Sevion. But uh, all right, three one is over. Five one ended before that. Don't go anywhere. We're going to take a quick break, and then it's the final portion of this match. One plus one bullet between Ali Reza Perugia and Sam Sevion.
A premium membership at chess.com will help you improve your game with full access to a powerful set of learning tools. Unlimited tactics let you practice like a master with more than 50,000 puzzles to challenge you at every level. Our library of interactive chess lessons created by master coaches will enhance every aspect of your game. And after each game you play, the computer analysis feature will give you feedback on every move you play, turning every game into a chance to learn. And that's not all. Premium benefits also include unlimited tournaments, video lessons, the opening explorer, and much, much more. Upgrade now to take your game to the next level. Welcome back, everybody. It's the Junior Speech Chess Championship quarterfinal round. This is the first leg, and today we have been watching Ali Reza Perugia and Sam Sevian battle it out. Two segments are in the books, and now it is time for the very highly anticipated one plus one. Why highly anticipated? Well, we've got one of the best junior bullet players in the world and one of the most mysterious, Robert, right? Yep, and I think everybody considers Ali Reza Perugia the heavy favorite here. But Sam Sevian is the number four ranked bullet player on chess.com server. He dominated his round of 16 matchup against Niall Sarin. So clearly he's a force, and we'll see if he can keep up with Ali Reza. I am pumped. It's a two-point margin at the moment. And, well, there's an opportunity for Sevian to start coming back. But obviously, it's going to be no joke. I mean, Ali Reza is boasting a 3,200 rating up there. Plus, Bullet gives him an opportunity to be a creative attacking player and play some offbeat lines. So we might see some, you know, nonsense openings, not as many Rue Lopez's, but we'll see. We'll see what happens. 30 this minutes is, on the clock. This is near the, well, okay, it didn't happen, but I was looking at this position. I was like, oh, they're going to follow the Nipo Giri um, game from round 11 from the Zagreb Grand Chess Tour tournament that just finished because you were saying nonsense openings, right? That game was kind of nonsensical. And it just happens, especially in bullet games, where you just go for an attack and it doesn't pin out at all and you're completely lost. Here, on the other hand, it's more positional in nature, where white is trying to break open the queen side, whereas knight on a5 is offside and moves like bishop d3 to keep the knight out of c4 makes sense, followed by queen a4 ideas. Okay, it goes b3, similar idea, keeping the knight on a5, bishop d2 was the idea, which is why knight of 6 was played, covering the square. And Levy, what are your thoughts in this position here? Mm -hmm. So far, so good looking for White. I mean, he's going to start to figure out how to get his bishops out and then slowly push that D pawn. I, I like how the rest of the bishop. Bishop D2 traps the knight on A5. Oh, wait. He, what? he just won the knight on A5. Oh, there's bishop C3. Okay, so bishop C3 would have been the response. No, but bishop D2? No, you're, you're winning it. I mean, you, you must be winning. Queen D2 and B4 at the end. Or... No. No, maybe, maybe not so clear. Barely surviving is how I see that. Yeah, but the knight is still... Okay, now it's back on c6. Still looks much, much better for white. He's got all the pressure against d6. He's like, he's looking at e5. I mean, you name it, and we're trying to play it. Watch out for d5. Yeah, black was trying to go d5 with a rook on a3 hanging. That's why he moved his rook back to a2. And look at this. Pawn structure, beautiful for... Sevian here, he is just much better in this position, up 16 seconds on the clock. Oh, oh my god. Did he miss rook d6? Didn't he just have rook d6? He plays it now, but I think he had it before. But this, this is obviously crushing. He's got a huge advantage here. Yeah, strategically, this is just over for black, but maybe he'll survive because it's bullet chess, and he, you know, he's a very quick player. Queen a5 to hit e5, potentially. Knight yep. four. Queen a5 is certainly coming, as you mentioned, hitting e5. This is just terrible. And the thing is, it's not a position where Ali Reza can seemingly, on the surface, create a huge amount of winning chances, but he's going to try his best. E5 hanging. Wait, A7 was also free? Oh, it, there, there it is. is. <laughs> Queen E3. Save your E4 pawn. You want to keep that pawn there. It is. Yeah, well spied. I mean, A7, I didn't even notice was hanging because there was a rook on C7 for so long, but if you can take it, grab it. I'm good over for one thing. Now. Over C7 is winning, right? No, because there was rook d1, yes. Okay, so now now what? g4, g5 is an idea for white, just like putting the pawn g4. So queen, oh, queen e3 can't be played. Now there's a bishop there, but you can play g3 yourself at the right moment. Say trades queens off the board and play f3. Oh, 
Oh, okay, rook d7 check. There he goes. And watch out, h8 is the wrong color pawn. So there's some opportunities if you go g3 and I trade everything there. Oh, take it. No, take it. Maybe he thinks the king's not getting out, but I thought if you take on g3 and sacrifice your bishop for the b pawn, I guess you're not going to get there in time because this is the wrong color pawn with the dark square corner. Wow. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess so. Wait, bishop c6 was always an option. So I thought he should have played bishop c6. Wow, this looked very good for Sevilla. Oh, don't make a draw. Oh, no. Bishop c6 looked very, very smart. I mean, he goes on king g1 and then bishop c6, and then he plays king to g2. Ali Reza first to double digits. The first game of the bullet portion is decided by a draw, but the players, they're, they're in a fighting mood. Uh, Sevian has had some good positions today. He just threw that one away. Yeah, well, they both had that. Ali Reza had a very good position that he, you know, he, he was winning, and then Sevian held, so... That's, um, we already we saw this from the players before also this kind of structure yeah uh, that completely insane game with the tactics on the king side later but uh, well see so what happens 25 minutes to go Sevian's got to overcome a two point disadvantage and typically black is like bishop c7 king g8 rook g8 g5 we saw that idea in the previous game queen g1 is a protect h2 right if I go d5 now h2 is not under threat so instead, we'll see some back and forth. G4 for white is always tempting because you can go G4, G5 real fast. If you'd like, black can play G5 himself. And knight E5. Okay, now your G pawn is stuck protecting F3. You don't want to ever touch this F pawn because then knight comes to G4. I like what Sevian's doing, honestly. Robert, I saw a comment that said that you and I are displaying blatant, unprofessional uh, favoritism for Sevian. How would you evaluate that statement? Um, no. I'm pretty Because <laughs> from the very beginning, we've talked about how uh, Fruge is the favorite. But in that game, when Seven was up a pawn and winning, you know, I'm trying to say who's winning. I'm not rooting for him to win, but if he's winning, kind of as a chess player, you want good chess to be played, and it's just ridiculous. Anyway, back to the chess here. It's ridiculous. Yeah, just Fruge is now up a pawn, B6 is hanging. Uh, this knight on h5, knight on g6 combination wants to get to f4, so b5 undermines the knight on d5. But bishop c5 is a nice move, going okay. for the e7 square. Ooh, cd5? If rook yeah. d5, it all looks good. It all does look good. So watch out if this knight gets removed from f, uh, sorry, from f5. Like, I can go bishop takes h2, knight g3 check in some lines just to mix things up. But, yeah. Knight g4. All right, I really want Ferruja to win this game. All right, how about, how, how's that for professionals? <laughs> there we go. There we go. Yeah, this is the, the only thing that's going to hold a position like oh. this is Rook F5? <laughs> I don't know. Wait, Rook F5 is actually really interesting. So I was looking at it with Knight H4 to follow. Ah. Rook F5 was certainly an option there. Wait, what? What just... I'm so confused. So many pieces on the board. Things getting treated like knight is coming to f4, but how powerful is this? Bishop b4 is a nice move. So just completely disregard the the queen hanging because you attack the queen yourself. Okay, I mean, well, Sevian, Sevian is has a bad position now, but at least he's doing well on the clock. And that bishop c6 trapped the oh no, didn't this queen e6? But this but surely they're not going to repeat. It's no way. Very fighting game. Just letting the players, this is, this is so tense, just letting these guys go. Oh. Oh. oh! That's a turn of events if I've seen one. Now, Bishop, okay, I was going to say put the Bishop on D8 first, but I like this. He's blocking the pawn. He's Bishop so solid. He can go F6 if he needs. He's so solid. Wow, this is ridiculous. Queen C6 coming now? Okay, he stopped it. Look at this blockade. Oh, my gosh. Oh, that's not even a threat. That's not even a threat. Yeah, I was about to say, what's going on there? G6? Nice C5. Nice C5. He doesn't have nice C5. Okay, he just comes back. Uh-oh. That's bad. That doesn't look very good at all. Yeah, King G1, though. King D5. Nice. Wow! Defending and attacking. Who's better and why? Queen E1. Oh, it's a draw. Oh, yeah. my gosh. It's going to be a draw. After all that. Oh my, I can't, I can't, wow, 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 <laughs> Robert Hess. 
what is happening? This reminds that reminds me of the first game of the entire match, right? Very double edge, both sides of chances. I mean, Ali Reza should have taken that game home, but Sevian is proving himself to be a worthy challenger in Bullet. We shouldn't be that surprised considering his 3146 rating in Bullet, and he just doesn't have much experience. But that oh, is crazy. I can't I can't get over the fact that we've played two bullet games and it's almost been 10 minutes of clock time. Like yeah. that's the that's the insane thing about one one is that these games go for a while. Yep. They are long games. I mean it's eight G and a half minutes off the clock. G4. Just push. There it is. Sevion has discovered his inner beast. Wow, he has gotten some great positions against um Rook A1. No, you don't try because you rook C8 first. But G5 uh -oh. is nice. wait, just rook C8. You just said rook C8. Oh, oh, so rook B1 first was necessary before playing G5, huh? No, this is completely lost because queen D3, rook C3, or queen C3, and knight E4. Yep. Oh man, he misses sad. this. Sad news, bad news. Rook B1 was winning, Akara says. Yeah, this definitely had to do that first. Bishop of six. If King D1 is E4, it's still E4. You go Queen A1, Queen C3, and make a draw if you're scared for whatever reason. Oh gosh. Queen A2 check wins the Queen on E2. Nasty. Just nasty. Well, that went from winning to losing very yeah. quickly. Yeah, I mean, the momentum that, that Sam built up just shot down within a minute and a half by Alireza. Very impressive. Very, very impressive. Uh, and I should also include that uh, I am complimenting Ali Reza not because I want him to win, but rather based on his most recent performance. <laughs> and Hikaru said the queen was indeed trapped in the case of rook b1, rook a1 ideas. Uh, it looked like it was going to get trapped. I just you know, was focusing on the pieces moving so quickly. But yes, Hikaru is absolutely right. It was uh, queen trappage. Wow. All right, so three-point advantage. 19 and a half minutes to go. It's... It's not super promising. I will say that. Uh, yeah. I also will say that the smarter chess match prediction has been spot on, at least thus far, because it's it's said that he's going to be up plus one in every single you know every single segment, and as of this very moment, he is. Maybe Ali Reza will pull away as Sevian slowly feels the match slipping. Ali Reza will smell blood, go in for the kill, right? But uh, yeah. Uh oh. Now he just lost the B pawn. The E pawn is weak. The E takes F5 is a free pawn. Oh, oh, this is this is bad news. Yeah, it's very bad news. It took eight and a half minutes to get through two games. It's going to take three minutes to get through the next two games. Well, Ali Reza... Ali Reza looking very good. Those queen side pawns are no joke. He should probably just resign and get to the next game. Right? Like, yeah, 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 for sure, for sure. Save match time, resign, gets the next game. There's still 18 and a half minutes left. Although now the bullet's clearly taking a turn in Ali Reza's favor. It's been very back and forth. Wait, isn't there's some free pieces here, right? Knight takes d8. Okay. He, he, just, he, play, he plays rook f2 and resigns. Yeah, even knight c5 check to win that rook was good. Yeah. All right, bishop g2. Very nice. Stuff so far from Ali Reza in the 1-1. One, one. He is living up to the hype. You know, sometimes uh, a player like Nihal Sarin, for example, touted as a favorite in that match, but a bit of a tilt. People said he played the match late in his time zone. All those are completely understandable reasons. That is not me being sarcastic for a change. <laughs> um, and you know, in this case, well, folks said that maybe he will, you know, he will continue, but I don't know. Robert, if you've got to pinpoint a game in this match, I actually want to ask this to the players. And obviously, after you lose a match, you don't want to psychoanalyze yourself and think about exactly when things went wrong in front of an audience like this. But Robert, what do you what, what do you think this match is getting a bit out of hand? Well, right now, it's just getting completely out of hand. Where <laughs> well, yes. I'm going to have another pawn here. But um, I don't know. You know, I, I was going to say early on, when it was they followed that McShane Dominguez game in game three, I thought that was a really bad loss for Sevian. But he really fought hard and fought back and uh, has made this a very tough match. But, yeah, these, the bullet games, I mean, you, yeah. You think it's the bullet? I think uh, maybe the last two or three games of the 3-1, that's probably, that's probably the right answer. I, I, 
he had a he had one like very nice game, I, I believe, and it went south, and then he was lost, and then he drew. And I, I also am curious if the players do kind of keep track of this themselves. Um, but I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. It's a good question for them. Yeah. Shout out to Georg Meyer, who was the was the captain of the Baden Baden Snowballs team, which were the second place in the Pro Chess League last season. He actually also just uh, took part in the Summer League series last week in the chat. But yeah, it's listen, the, the, there is like no moment to breathe in these matches, it feels like. You can't ever pat yourself on the back. Like out of the gate, you know, Sam wins that game. It's like big excitement. It, you know, everybody's cheering. And then and then Ferruji just goes, uh-uh, uh-uh. And he wins two games. Yep. Just like, uh-uh. We're not having any of that. You got that lucky one. Now I'm going to get two back. And I'm curious even what the player's thoughts are on, like, momentum. I mean, it's one thing to be in there playing all these games, going through the motions, the, the, the motions and the emotions, I should say. But, like, ultimately, do, do, they, do they learn anything from, from these, these kinds of match situations, even though it is online and it's bullets, it's blitz? Is there anything that they can take away from this uh, for their class? I don't know. I'm curious. Well, yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure they get, like, a feel for certain positions, right? Because um, even in classical, you want to be able to play through the opening phase relatively quickly so you can conserve your clock for the tougher positions and the more complex positions. Um, so I think just how comfortable you feel in opening is important. Yeah. Well, I think we, we all like comfort in the opening. Or I don't know, some, some of us don't, but I know I do. Uh, there was some trick there with Bishop. No, no, there wasn't any tricks. Uh, looks like Perugia is just wrapping up another game. This is, if, if, if Sam loses one more game, this is going to remind me of the all-time famous Greece Shirt Speeches Championship interview, which went to the tune of like, you know, I believe that we should be able to stop the match. <laughs> <laughs> just, just ring a little bell. That's it. I'm yep. done. I'm good. Can I throw in the towel, please? But uh, there's there's money at stake. Robert, it was uh, we were together on a commentary. Was it in the Pro Chess League when one of the matches was decided with a full round to go, something like that? Yeah, there have definitely been rounds in the PCL. Lopsided matchups happen, but uh, you know. Play it out. And Danny Wrench goes, this is why Ferruja is the favorite to so many people because he just is blowing uh, Sevian off the board here. Just every single game, Ferruja doing it. All right, Danny Wrench goes, but Hikaru is right. We haven't seen Ali Riza be tested yet. If someone could have a lead against him and put him on the emotional side of things, how would he do? Well, I'm honestly, you know, I thought Sam would be a really tough matchup, but... Uh, well, Ali Reza has done well in this bullet portion, but I'm, I'm waiting for if it's next in line, which I'm not sure it is. Oh, I guess he would play Wei Yi next. No, I was looking more towards like Jeffrey Zhang versus Ali Reza. I think that would be a fascinating match. Also, friends, remember we had a daily question. Who of these players uh, do you find the most interesting, uh, most interesting, most exciting? And the answer is not as, uh, not as kind of straightforward as you would think. Just going to read a few here. I'm not sure we have a graphic, but I'll pull this up. So uh, Josh, Joshua Tan at JT underscore the kids and says, I'm most excited to see Gladura because I haven't had the chance to see him play in many events. Uh, the others are more, you know, playing more over the board online, that kind of thing. Uh, another user at Melkor91 says, for me, it's Wei Yi because of his spectacular style. And of course, Ferruja because of the razor sharp speed chess play. And in this format in particular, he would choose Ali Reza. Robert, what about you? You you said you had a unique answer. I like Jeffrey Zhang. I love watching Jeffrey play. I think he mixes it up frequently. Um, I think that he is just he's a very aggressive player. He loves fighting. So I'm a big fan of watching him play. Hey, and look what Danny says. I voted for Zhang over the board and Fruja online. That's kind of I would agree with that. Yeah, I, I think I think for me it's Zhang as well. He uh Obviously, you know, a player like Hikaru knows Zhang from a, from a much different perspective. He played in the U.S. Championship, but it was Rook G1, <laughs> G, Rook G1 Knight Orb. According to the Chess.com openings database, this is called the Freak Attack, Robert. 
So we're getting our freak attack on. It's 3 p.m. on a, you know, on a Tuesday, but I guess we can get our freak attack on. Yeah, I mean, where's Giannis, right? He'd, he'd approve. Yeah, he would approve. Uh, but, you know, for, for us, like, watching Zhang grow over the years, um, now he's crossing 2,700. He just won World Open. So many of his games feature different openings, different lines, interesting positions. Also, he's just, like, a really nice, like, really nice and down-to-earth guy. Which yep. Is, you know, which is pretty ironic, I could say that about somebody, right? So, um I really like watching him play as well. Obviously, Ali Reza versus Hikaru is a, is a marquee. I mean, it's one of those things where those guys can play in an official match or they can scrap like behind the alley of a bar. You know, it's like one of those, they, <laughs> they, they don't need an excuse or a prize fund to punch each other in the face, metaphorically speaking, in chess, right. which is one thing I really, I, I really do enjoy about their matches. So, well, but for me, it's probably Zhang. Yeah, I know. I'm, I'm a big fan of most of these players, um, but <laughs> this isn't the Bronx. <laughs> uh, watch out for this Rook on A1. What's going on with Sevian? His connection has been a bit off. E6, he'll meet with Knight F6 check, so he doesn't lose a piece. Uh, because the idea is Bishop coming to C3. If you want to kick this Knight out, E6, the Knight F6. Problem is you can't even take on F6 because A5 is hanging. So... Whoa, e4 fell. Is he really thinking about taking on c2? Or okay, just thinking about which way to take on g6. Rook c2 is not a threat. The bishop was pinned. So uh oh. Uh oh. Oh, and your king rook takes g6, game over. Rook g6! Play rook g6! That's yes. nice. That's game very over. nice. Got what a root. Yeah. Got, got a root for the guy who's down six points in the match. Yeah, absolutely. He does get a win, but Ali Reza obviously is still super, super strong. Just under 10 minutes remaining. Basically, at this point, this is these games are these are cash prize games, everybody. We can uh, maybe pull up the prizes graphic. That's that's fun. Everybody likes cash. A lot of money at stake in this Beaches Championship Series, whether that's junior women's. Oh, uh, sorry. oh no. no! You're you're going crazy over the moves. The Queenie Ford check. I mean, you're things aren't going right for White anymore. No, oh. all the rest is making this interesting. Oh, this is sad. Like even when you're completely winning, you still aren't winning. That's not a good feeling. Ah, uh, well, that's sometimes what happens, right? I mean, you 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 lose a couple of games and things just don't go your way at all. Robert and I having a mutual commentator's moment of silence for <laughs> Sevian. Uh, it's looking more and more likely that his. Junior Speeches Championship campaign does come to an end. Yeah, it's one of those moments where you start feeling badly where he just, you know, had this Rook takes G6 tactic, he found it, should just be good for him, and yet somehow he's still in trouble here where um, he it's just, when Farouche is on, he's on, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. I mean, Farouche was, was looking busted in this game, and since then, three minutes have gone off the game clock, and it's not clear whatsoever what's happening. Yep. Uh, it's easy to take perpetual, but he can also play this endgame forever and ever, and Sevian has to worry about the flag. So... <sighs> Queen G1. Oh, I made point three left. Wow. All right. Now, now he's, we can bail out, or we can play the pawn endgame forever and ever, right? So... Who's first? Uh oh, King F3 to G2? Or just the pawns are rolling? Oh, no. Wow. And oh, no. Reza wins the endgame. Look at that. They're, they're, call, they're calling the ambulance outside Robert Hess's house. And what Sevian did to Nihal Sarin is now happening in reverse as Ali Reza 5 1 up in the 1 1. And okay, we will have maybe three or four more games, but are we calling it? I think we're calling it. Yeah. But yeah. At this, point, at this point, the players, like I said, they're playing for cash money. 600 bucks goes to the winner of this match, but the rate, remaining 600 is split between the. <laughs> are split between the. Uh, the win percentage. So Savion can get a win or two more. He, he's got some. He's got some cool cash that he's winning. I like to play bullet. 
and get like 30, 40 bucks a game. Yeah, not bad, right? I know, right? Like, okay, man. going right for the G6 square. Something looks wrong here with this. Knight G4. Gosh, Rook G6 is Rook Knight G4, or maybe Queen G6. That's weird. Going after C6, going after A7. Yeah, this isn't good. this isn't right. No, it hasn't been right in a while. Notice actually, Sevian hasn't won a game. He drew the first two, and things looked like they were going right, but immediately, immediately, once Ruja got one game, got off his feet, started running, it was downhill, and it's been downhill since. That's the thing about some of these matches, like even the Sevian Nihal Sarin match. You remove the one-one portion, and it's close. Relatively speaking, this one the same. You remove six one, it's nine and a half, seven and a half. So the high level chess was played in the five one three one, still obviously high level bullet, but well, Alirus is just showing the experience, the dominance, and uh, now Chad is already discussing whether he'll be better than Magnus Robert. <laughs> it's funny to say the experience in Perugia because Sevian's a couple years older, mm -hmm. like two and a half years older, or something like that, but. It's true that Perugia just plays much more frequently online. So he is the more experienced speed chess player. And while well, he's showing that experience off, and Queen E7 check should be good. Knight F7, just you can take and take on E6. What are you doing? How many pawns is black up? I'm down, excuse me. Oh, only one? Yeah, just one. Yeah. But, okay, you're down... Seven games in the match, and you're down. Well, no pawns now, but your king isn't very safe. Levy, it's hard, man. It's hard. I just, I feel a little deflated here. Yeah, sometimes, sometimes that happens, right? I mean, it's one-one in the bullet. Sevian still two games away. Had very nice chances. He carves in the chat, cheering, cheering on Sevian's chances. And uh, now it's six-one. <laughs> Maybe seven-one. Obviously, this isn't a, a game that you're going to win, but well, at this point, you just go out, you go for spike. You go, I'm just going to beat him in one game. Yep. I need to win a game. Wow. And look at, the, look at that stat. Stevian hasn't won in 10 games. That's rough. 10? Oh, yeah. I guess he's drawn a couple ways in one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's not good. Yeah, that's not going to get it done. All right, a draw? And the real question I'm having is, how high is Farouge's bullet rating going to go? Well, he once was that fabled 3,300. But you know what the other school of thought is. The higher his rating goes, the, the, the higher Hikaru's will go. Because Hikaru's going to farm some of that rating. So there's a bit of a, a little bit of a hierarchy on chess.com. That's what <laughs> Danny, Danny Rancher said. Hikaru is licking his yeah. lips at Farouge's rating. Uh-huh, uh-huh. You get some of this, but you got, you, you got to bring it right back here, boy. You, you yeah. know where that rating is going. So. Absolutely. Uh, Knight H5 with a tempo. Okay, when here first. Yeah. Then next going right to F5. That's going to be a really scary to deal with, especially because of the pawn structure, right? If your pawn was on H7, you go G6. If your pawn on H6, now you can't put a pawn on g6. It's going to be sacrificed for immediately. So be careful. Be very careful. This looks really bad for black, especially in a bullet game. Um, yeah, but Farouche has been very resourceful. Even the positions where he's seemingly been struggling, he's managed to hold his own. And Knight e3 wins a piece because knight e3, you're attacking the queen. You take oh, the yeah, 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 just knight e3, right? Bishop h7 check at the end. So... Yeah, this is just winning. There it is. And you take the bishop on d5. Notice, so watch, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, Robert, like, notice it took Sevian about 15 seconds to play that move. Like, right, he actually thought about it. I mean, that move, Ali Reza would have played that move before Queen F6 was on the board. Like, <laughs> that, that's the thing. I mean, he is just, it's, he's a machine. You just play 93. Boom. You didn't even have to think. 97 check, work of three, rookie, uh, three mate. Is that happening here? Probably a little too slow. G6 happens. Or rook f3, g4. Anastasia's mate, maybe. Rook g5, rook h5, some stuff like that. Two minutes remaining. Looking like we will have one final game. I don't know exactly how the math works out, but that game could be worth like 50 bucks. Yep. Oh. I love it. I love it. Give the players what they deserve. After that, everybody, we will take a quick break. 
announce the final score, and we will be joined by the players live on call to talk to us about the match, about their plans in the future, and maybe some tips and tricks for all of you. I know you guys are good at a lot of stuff, but they're the superior chess players, so don't go anywhere. We'll talk to them, get some advice, maybe life advice. I'd love to hear, like, Savion's like, philosophy on life. <laughs> you know, I, I would like some chess advice from both of them. They're uh, <laughs> clearly very, very talented and improving, right? Uh, both of them trying to reach that 2,700 club that their fellow competitor, Jeffrey Zhang, just did. And uh, well, both are both of them are great, obviously. Also, Sevian's up how many pieces and pawns now? Four? A lot, pawns? but... Minor piece? You think Ali Reza will resign and try to win a game in the final minute of the match? Or do you think he's just going to play this out until there's no time left? Yeah, he'll resign now. No? Yeah? Uh, well, Queen F8 was made in one. Yep, too hard to see, though. Okay, yeah, main three is easier than main one. Hikikaru peeking up at Ali Reza. <laughs> it's the final game of the first quarterfinal in the Speech Chess Championship. Junior Speech Chess Championship, I should say, 2018. 19. 19. I'm living in the past, Robert. Did I really say 18? Whatever. <laughs> uh, maybe I was, I was dreaming about how many points Ali Reza would score, but uh, he's got 16. Looks like he won't get to... He's not going to get to the 18, but 16 points. Very, very nice. Yep. 10. 9. Doing the countdown? Trying to get a last second shot off? <laughs> Maybe. I mean, play it out, see what happens. Savion played really, really well, but yeah, I mean, it, it looks like if you start out the, bl the, the bullet down two games from the blitz, it's, it's very difficult. And Icaro says, Sevian played an almost perfect match, just couldn't quite win that Spanish game or one of the first two bullet games. Yeah, you know, I mean, we, we all said that Ferruja was the favorite. Sevian put up a great fight, and he was very close throughout the majority of the match. Of course, then during the final segment, the 1-1, the bullet, he just didn't have it going on. And unfortunately for him, well, Ali Reza is just an absolute monster. And, well, now Ali Reza is also up in exchange. And this is just should be winning for Ferruja. We'll see how Seven tries to fend him off. But we're looking forward to the interviews with both players. Levy, I'm excited to ask them some questions. What about you? Any particular thing you want to know from the players? Yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, definitely that, that question revolving around, you know, how they followed some games that were played even a week or two ago. And without disclosing too much of, you know, of their personal records, obviously those are very important. Um, just curious how aware they were of that, whether the element of surprise is important or whether the element of uh, just playing positions where you're comfortable, some, something along those lines. And then we just kind of see as we go. You know, we won't have Ruslan joining us for Russian translation this time, which is exciting. <laughs> it's it so energetic. I love it. That was, that was very fun. That, that last interview was basically just a couple of Russian bros talking in a sauna or something. That, that, that's, <laughs> that's, what, that's what that was. Yep. Yeah. Um, and this is about to be a G pawn rushing down the board here. Ah! Russian. I love it. Glad you picked up on it. That, was, that one was for you. <laughs> okay, so how do we win this game? 97 checking F8 and stop. Um, it's A4, yeah. Take A5. Uh, he's going to go rook f7, 97 check, rook h7, mate. Game over. We're done with this one. Levy? Yeah. Ali Reza Farusha, the winner in the first quarterfinal of the Junior Speech Chess Championship. Like I just said, everybody, the result is official, but we are not done. We will be back, joined by the players live on call for player interviews. Don't go anywhere.
Welcome back, everybody. The first quarterfinal of the Junior Speech Championship just wrapped up with Ali Reza, Reza victorious over Sam Savion. We're now joined by both players live on call, where we'll get to hear their thoughts. So uh, I'll start off my question first to Ali Reza, then, then to Sam. Uh, how satisfied were you with how the match went in the, in the three segments? And where do you think really the tide Ali Reza shifted in your favor? Yeah, of course, I'm very satisfied with the bullet. As I was expected, I played like that. Uh, Factless one, this first game was very, it very tilted me. And yeah, when I was a piece up and I just blundered everything. Yeah, I think the worst uh, format was for me was five plus one today. But in general, I think I played a good chess. And Sam, I guess the, the same question to you. Um, Overall satisfied with the match strategy. Obviously, the bullet always makes scorelines look a little bit lopsided. But where do you think the things started going kind of wrong? Oh uh, well, I mean, I, I had some missed opportunities in five, one, and three, one. Uh, this Berlin, I gave a pawn in the opening, and I, I had a slip near the end of the three, one, and even the first game with the bullet when I was completely winning, that game kind of shifted things. Yeah. Um, and I have a question, kind of a broader question for the two of you. Ali Reza, in the third game of the five-minute segment, you repeated McShane Dominguez, which happened a couple weeks ago. Uh, did, were you studying these games intensely? Was that something you already knew? Like, what was your preparation like for the match? Yes, of course, I saw that game. And suddenly it came to my mind, I was not going to play this line in this match, but I don't know, suddenly I played this and... Yeah, I think that was a very good choice. Yeah, and Sam, um, did you were you familiar with that game? And what was I, I your was, I was like? familiar, but it's really hard to remember in a five-minute game. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I couldn't remember all the details. Yeah. Yeah, we we were obviously we were talk, talking about some of these games, and we were curious whether, um, and again, op open to both of you, but uh, in in a match like this one, do you think that? you should just play the stuff that you're the most comfortable with, or is the element of surprise more important? Or is the element of surprise better in like a one one game in classical? I guess, Ali Raza, we could start with you. I think it's possible to play every line because uh, there's lots of chances to come back. If you lose the one game, it doesn't matter. So I think it's possible to try, try everything is in your head and finally something will work. Make sense? Yeah. And uh, Sam, I mean, you know, unfortunately, this is the end of the road for you in the Junior Speech Chess Championship, but how would you say your, your performance was? How did you enjoy the experience? Uh, tell everybody what it was like for you. Um, I mean, it was very fun. Both of the matches were very intense for me. And the thing is, like, near the third hour, in both matches, I got really tired. I started blundering. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah, it's very tough if playing for so many hours. Of course, it's not easy. And Ali Reza, for you, uh, you know, you've just won this match, which means you're going to move on to face the winner <laughs> of Wei Yi and Jordan Van Forest. Uh, who would you prefer to face, and what do you rate your odds at in the next round? Of course, it's clear that I, who I want to face, but <laughs> I don't think that, that is going to happen. <laughs> Okay, so you think that Wei Yi is going to win, but what do you rate your odds are against a player like Wei Yi? Yeah, I think it's it will be a close match. I don't know how can I even rate because I'm much better in bullet, and I don't know it's it's not clear. I think it will be a very nice, interesting match. Yeah, I think Chad is very much. I mean, it would be very exciting. A lot of people, Ali Reza, think that even though Wei Yi is the number one seed, that you might be the, the favorite to win it. So if that it does become the matchup, that's it's going to be very exciting and definitely for the audience. My final question, uh, more big picture, this match aside, uh, can go to Sam first on this one. So bo both of you actually are currently very near your peak in classical, Sam. I think maybe you're one month removed. So uh, maybe just talk about what, what goes into that. I mean, obviously, you've been a, a top player for a long time. Uh, what goes into your improvement nowadays? Is it just execution? Because obviously you have a lot of knowledge, or is it something else? Have you changed maybe the way you're studying, what you're studying, things like that? No, I mean, I think that's right. It is execution. I'm still trying to improve. 
the beach one like yeah, yeah. I think it, we, uh, we both have we both have lots of uh, thing to do and we can improve much better of course we have a lot to do <laughs> <laughs> yeah there's definitely a lot of hard work of course that remains but you two are both been very impressive and I just want to get final thoughts on you know, Jeffrey Zhang just crossed 2700 he's one of the fellow competitors in this junior speed chess championship Sam you know him very well over the years, being of the you know, same age. Um, you know, what what do you make of his performance in recent months? And um, you know, how how can you explain that kind of progress to the fans who may not understand the difference between twenty six seventy and twenty seven hundred? Yeah, I mean, in recent months he's been playing really well, and I'm happy for him finally cross twenty seven hundred. Um, I mean, the difference probably isn't that big between twenty six seventy and twenty seven hundred. But um, it's just those little things that you have to do right. Ali Reza, would you agree? The difference is pretty, <coughs> but just a few exec, you know, ex executing a few points better is uh, makes the big difference there. I don't know. Okay, it's just a matter of time to get twenty seven hundred. So twenty seven hundred is not a goal, of course. <laughs> I like it. Going for even further heights. It's that, yeah, that's very, very nice. So, well, thank you both for joining us and, and giving us this great match. You know, Chad enjoyed it. Robert and I had a great time looking at the game. So, see you, uh, Sam. See you, obviously, in, in, in some upcoming tournaments. And Alireza, we will see you back for the for the semifinal. So, take care. Thanks, guys. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Robert and I, uh, we are going to jump into just the upcoming schedule. Uh, for the Junior Speeches Championship. Tomorrow, we've got Wei Yi and Jordan Van Forest. We saw Ali Reza have a laugh about that. <laughs> he, he, he knows who he wants to play out of that match. Uh, but, you know, obviously, he when, he when he's playing Wei Yi, he might have a small chip on his shoulder, but I think he's very confident. July 11th, Maksud Sarana, and on July 16th, the newly minted 2700, Jeffrey Jean goes up against Benjamin Gurdura, who's actually studying at Webster University. So I think he's also just going to get better and better uh, in the coming time. I think that's that's basically where we're at right now, Robert. Yeah, and I mean, I, I will say that tomorrow's matchup between Wei Yi and Jordan Van Forest, I know everybody has their money on, well, not their actual physical money, but uh, their money on Wei Yi in that matchup, but Jordan Van Forest just tied for first in the Dutch Championship. He's been playing very good chess um, lately, and in fact, he lost to his brother in the tie breaks for the Dutch Championship. The, the younger brother, the lower-rated brother, actually defeated him in that tiebreak. So if that goes to show anything, is that, well, the player with the lower rating can spring an upset. Van Forest was impressive in beating Ari Antari in the first round, a very uh, difficult matchup for both players. So I think tomorrow will be fascinating. A lot of action coming up in the near future, both in with respect to the JSEC and, of course, the Isle of Man qualifier, which I believe is on July 17th, which is the four winners of the Title Tuesday events of the last four months. They will duke it out for a spot in the Super Swiss tournament. But, Levy, it's been a pleasure on my end. Um, it was really a great event. Of course, we started off with a missed checkmate in one, and then it was uh, all fun from there. So thank you for joining me for this epic match. Yeah, it's been it's been absolutely amazing. Always a pleasure with my, you know, my, my, my fellow New Yorkers sweltering in this heat. So we've been informed who the right destination is to. Y'all, we're sending you over to Bigfoot. Uh, I believe doing a stream with Helms Night, if I'm not mistaken. So take care, everybody. We'll see you back here tomorrow for the second leg of the quarterfinals Junior Speech Championship 2019, not 18.